Restorative justice means restoring victims, restoring offenders and restoring communities. It's about the idea that because crime hurts, justice should heal. Or, or more broadly, because any kind of injustice hurts, a justice process uh, should heal. So restorative justice is a process where all of the stakeholders in the crime, in the injustice, are invited along to discuss who's been hurt by the injustice and what might be done to repair the harm and to reach an agreement that they sign on what might be done. Restorative justice is a different way of thinking about who will be in the room for a justice process. In a criminal trial, we invite along those who can inflict most damage on the other side of the case. For a restorative justice process, we invite along those who can offer most support to their own side, be it the victim side or the offender side. So it's a meeting of two communities of care. Restorative justice has a, has a long history. Uh, most of the world's indigenous peoples have some sort of justice tradition which is participatory, which is restorative, which involves a group of people from the village sitting in a circle to discuss who's been hurt and what might be done to repair the harm of the, of, of the injustice. In the 1970s, there was an alternative dispute resolution movement uh, internationally, and the new wave uh, of restorative justice was, was, was part of that. Uh, some say that the, the first modern restorative justice program was in Kitchener, Ontario in Canada uh, in, the, in the 1970s, and from there spread throughout North America and around the world. And that was a sort of a victim-offender mediation, so less of a sense of a, of a whole village, you know, it takes the whole village to raise a child kind of thing, more a professional mediator with one victim, one uh, offender. Then in 1989, the New Zealanders came up with the innovation of restorative justice conferencing. And that has spread throughout the world. It's been very influential, including here in Australia. Uh, so this has been influenced by New Zealand Maori traditions of how to do justice. It involves a larger group of stakeholders sitting in a circle, not just the victim, the offender, and the mediator, but a conference facilitator. First part of the process is meeting with the offender and saying to the offender, who are the people who you most trust and respect and who you would want to have come along to support you through this difficult uh, process of having to meet the, the victim and talk about um, what you've done and what might be done to put things, things right. And they will usually, if they're a child, nominate mum and dad, but not just mum and dad, brothers, sisters, uncles, aunts, grandparents, perhaps, perhaps a football coach if the young person says that this is the person who I have a special relationship of trust uh, with. So this is the idea of a community of care that are the people who will support your side of the case, who will speak well of you so that you will have a reintegrative process. And then the facilitator will go to the victim and say, well, there will be a number of people there uh, supporting the, the offender. So it's important that you're not alone without support so the same the same thing who are the people who who you most trust who you would like to to have support you through the uh, uh, through the process so this is the idea of the New Zealanders in putting together the two communities of care in the first part of the conference it, uh, a New Zealand restorative justice uh, conference process will talk about what happened uh, who was hurt, uh, both the victim and the offender will give their account of what happened and there will be a, a process of gen uh, general agreement as to what happened, perhaps some elements of disagreement and that's important of course, if it's a burglary for the offender to be able to say, oh well I stole that, but no I didn't steal, I didn't steal that, which is a practical issue that sometimes 
comes up, given the insurance claims and so on. So there will be uh, agreement on what's agreed upon and uh, then agreement on what might be done uh, to, uh, to repair the, the harm. And there might be many participants in the conference who, who will agree to do uh, particular things. So that, for example, uh, if it's agreed after a violent offence that the offender should go to an anger management program, one of the family members might speak up and say, oh, last time he went to court, the court, the judge's order was that he go to an anger management program. He went for the first two weeks and then stopped going and nothing happened. And then Uncle Harry might speak up and say, well, I will take him every Tuesday night and I will take responsibility for making sure uh, that, he, uh, that he does go. And then Uncle Harry will become a signature, signatory to the agreement for that little bit of the agreement for making sure that this time he actually completes the anger management program, completes the drug rehabilitation program, if that's what's agreed. Yes, yeah, so one of the concerns that's often expressed about restorative justice, and it's a legitimate concern, is that with the most difficult cases of crime, might it not be that that, that person just is alone in the world and, and doesn't have a, have a community of support? And it certainly is a very real scenario that you'll have a conference where, uh, you know, where mum and dad don't want to come along. Or, or, or whether there, where there's uh, sexual abuse that's occurred in the, in the family so that the nuclear family is actually toxic uh, for the young person. One of the first conferences that I went along to was in a, in a, in a country town uh, in, in Australia. It was a conference conducted by uh, Senior Sergeant uh, Terry O'Connell of the uh, uh, New South Wales Police at that at that time, and I arrived at the conference with uh, uh, Terry just at the same time as the mother of this girl who was in trouble with the police was arriving. The girl was 14 years old and she'd committed a, a number of major burglaries in association with some other 14-year-old girls. So when Terry and I are arriving for the conference, the mother is arriving at the same time and she says, I'm not happy about being here, you know. And Terry says, I'll give it a go. So we then go into the room. And as she walks into the room, she says to her daughter, I'll kill you, you little bitch. To which the daughter replies something rather more appropriate, like, hi, mum. Uh, so so we, we, we get underway and Terry calms things down uh, quite well. And we, but we only get about two minutes into the conference. And mum is up again and pointing a quivering finger and her, at her daughter and says, this is a load of nonsense. She should be punished. And she storms out of the, uh, of the conference. Well, I looked across at Terry and said, well, th this really works well, doesn't This was one of our, one of our very first experiments with restorative justice uh, conferencing uh, uh, in Australia. But you know, it did work out well in the end because what happened was that all of these angry victims had turned up turned up for the conference and they were very angry, like that, their perception is changed and now they're feeling sorry for the girl that they get getting some uh, insight into her family situation, which indeed was a family situation where she didn't have support from her parents, her father hadn't turned up at all and there was suggestion that there might be abuse going on in the family and that's why this girl was living on the street. She wasn't living with, uh, with, with her family. So as a result of this, of, of this encounter, uh, other members of the extended family, uncles, sisters, aunts, were able to offer the kind of support to this girl uh, that she wasn't being offered by her nuclear family. So that she was able to, as a result of the conference, to move off the street and live uh, with with, uh, with with another with another relative, uh, she was uh, persuaded to go back to school. She hadn't been to school for a long a long time, so she was living on her wits on the uh, on on the streets. So that 
the thing that, uh, that restorative justice can offer in the hardest cases where there is not such a great natural community of care around the uh, uh, alleged offender is that one can be constructed, a new and better one, a support network uh, can be constructed that people will stand up to feel a sense of family responsibility uh, to, to pick up uh, where the nuclear, the extended family, picking up the responsibilities that, as it were, have been dropped in this case by the, uh, by the, by the nuclear families. But more than that, uh, street kids are, are interesting. There was a wonderful study called Mean Streets uh, by uh, John Hagen, Bill McCarthy, John Hagen, and it was done of street children on the streets of large Canadian cities, Toronto, Vancouver. And, and what they found is that children on the streets had what they, they called street families. And they actually used that, that expression so that they did have a, have a community of care. This is just they weren't a traditional community of care. And so these children would support them, would protect them if they were at risk of uh, for example, sexual victimization on the streets. So they were they were offering practical care. So they indeed were a support network that should be involved uh, in a in a restorative justice process. So the paradox of restorative justice, if you if you like, is yes yes of course it's more difficult to make restorative justice work if a child does not have a strong uh, network of 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 support. But it's hard to make anything work. It's hard to make a traditional criminal uh, process and a traditional forms of uh, juvenile justice rehabilitation work effectively in that, uh, in that context. But the, it's the capacity of the restorative justice uh, conference to build community where there was not community there of support there before. Another case involved uh, uh, a a young man who was a good uh, rugby player and uh, he was refusing to live with his parents. So one of the things that was done in that restorative justice process was to assemble the mums and dads and the, the, the other young men in the, in the rugby team because the rugby team was where he enjoyed most respect and high regard and a, a positive social space. So they went around the rugby team and said, well, would, would any of you be willing to have him come and live in, in your family rather than live on the streets? And three, three families offered to, from the rugby team, offered to take him in. He went to the first family, he actually didn't like it, uh, and, uh, and then moved on to a second family who had made the offer and built a successful life, uh, for rebuilt a life for himself. Uh, with that, uh, with that, with with that second family. So it's when the possibilities for reintegration and rehabilitation are hardest that that the the that the creative response capabilities of restorative justice can be very useful. In the 1980s, I worked on business regulation, and following inspections, government inspections of nursing homes, following occupational health and safety inspections of, of coal mines, it was pretty standard practice in this country, in the United States, in other countries, to have an exit conference. And this would involve people sitting around the walls of a, a room or around a large table to discuss what harms are being done to old people in the nursing home and what might be done to repair the the harm. So there was a lot of restorative justice elements in those business regulatory processes. So in the context of that, we weren't calling it restorative justice in those days in the 19, uh, 1980s. We were, we were just calling them uh, uh, conferences. And then when the New Zealand uh, uh, process came along, we became uh, aware in a more sophisticated way that was informed uh, by the uh, wisdom of Maori thinking on restorative justice, what what might be involved, but philosophically, I had a a, a much longer interest as a result of uh, reflecting on my father's experience in 
in World War II. He was one of six survivors out of 2,500 men on the Sandakan death march in Borneo in World War II. This was a Japanese prisoner of, of, of war uh, camp. And my mother had lost her first husband uh, uh, on the death march and my dad went to see her after the war and to report what, what had happened to her husband and then they ended up getting uh, married. And it was a big thing in the life of our family and there were many incidents related to justice that surrounded uh, that particular uh, war crime, and it was a war crime, the death march. Uh, one thing that happened was that the, uh, the men were paid in little coins that they could use to get an extra portion of rice. They were starving. Uh, but if they would work on building an, an airstrip for the Japanese Air Force, they would get these, uh, these coins. And they had no private space. They would pile up the coins that they earned at the end of their, their bed. Coins went missing one day, and there was some circumstantial evidence pointing to one young soldier. Uh, so they had a kangaroo court, and he was uh, convicted, and his sentence was a sort of a shaming sentence that he was sent to Coventry. No one was to talk to him. That have a, had a devastating effect on that young man, he, and he died rather quickly. Soon after he died, they discovered the coins, which were in a rat, rat's nest. The rat had taken the coins up into the roof of their, uh, of, of their hut. So that, that caused a lot of conversations in our family about the injustice that can arise from informal justice that's, that's done badly without checks and balances. And it's very much a risk with restorative justice. But also there was much about the formal justice that occurred in relation to the war crime of the, of the death march that, that occurred there. One of, the, one of the six survivors on his deathbed confessed to false testimony against one of the Japanese officers that had, had hung uh, for a war crime. He actually wasn't there when the particular crime, the particular murder for which he was hung occurred. He, in the view of, of this survivor of the death march, had done many other uh, terrible things, so he fabricated this, uh, this testimony against him. And of course, fabricated testimony can have a lot of power in that context. Uh, most survivors, survivors, most witnesses have, have died. So the quality of justice that you, uh, that, that, that you get can, can be very, uh, very poor. So that with both the formal justice and the informal justice, there were, there were great problems. My brother, Dick Braithwaite, has been involved in recent years in meeting the families of some of these senior uh, Japanese officers who did hang uh, for the war, war crimes. And uh, so there's a process of interfamily uh, and Australia-Japan uh, reconciliation underway there. There's a lot of delay in our criminal justice system. There's a system capacity, system overload problem. And restorative justice can certainly help with that. A restorative justice process can be put together uh, more, uh, more quickly, uh, more flexibly, can be reconvened if it's not going well, much more quickly than a court can adjourn a case and decide to come together in another hearing scheduled a few months down the, uh, down the track. On the other side of it, part of the philosophy of restorative justice is that is that speedy justice is not always the ideal with uh, terrible crimes of violence, say sexual offences against women. It often takes a long time before the victim is, is ready uh, to deal with uh, the, the offence. And so a restorative justice process can, can begin in a very gradual way. And there's all sorts of ways that gradualism uh, can occur. There have been cases in, in New Zealand where the victim has not met face to face with the offender, but there's been a preliminary hearing where the victim 
has been behind a one-way mirror where she's seeing into the conference. She has a phone beside her, can pick it up and say, well, I actually do want to say something. Or she can decide to stay out of the conference. So you can have a preliminary process like that and then wait until the, the victim might be confident enough to, to fully engage with the justice process. So one of the things restorative justice can bring to the justice process because of its flexibility is find a way so that in time uh, it's a possibility for everyone to get the justice that they need uh, out, of the, out, of, out of the criminal justice uh, process. Uh, for victims, uh, it, the research suggests that restorative justice reduces the amount of victim fear uh, that is ex experienced. Now, not always. Sometimes restorative justice makes things worse for victims, but more than twice as often as that, uh, it, it reduces the amount of fear that very often the victim has this image of the perpetrator as being a very powerful person, whereas when they meet them uh, with their community of support, they come to realise that the, the, the perpetrator is someone who has a great many inadequacies and begins to talk, talk through those, uh, uh, those, those inadequacies. So uh, victim healing is a very important outcome, an outcome that's rather neglected by the uh, traditional uh, criminal justice system, helping victims to feel safe, helping victims to, uh, to move on, and also helping victims to have a sense that their rights have been respected. So in the evaluation research on restorative justice, we ask victims, we ask offenders, uh, have your rights been respected in the justice process? And in, in cases here in, in Canberra where Lawrence Sherman and Heather Strang randomly assigned criminal cases to restorative justice versus the uh, Canberra, Canberra courts, paradoxically, in the restorative justice process where there are fewer formal guarantees of rights, both victims and offenders were much more likely to report that their rights were being respected. So outcomes that are important are reduced fear, uh, a, a sense of being ready to move on with, with, with one's life, getting a sense of justice. So in the research again, we're interviewing people, asking them, did you feel that what happened was a just process in your terms? So uh, perceptions that the process is procedurally fair are higher in cases randomly assigned, assigned to a restorative justice conference than to cases that go to court. It's not just uh, individual healing or individual repair that's important. Institutional transformation is also important. So that if you have, for example, a pattern of violence in a, uh, in a high school, say violence between boys and girls in a high school, what a conference process can do is get the whole school assembled in a sense, not just the particular individuals who are engaging in the violence, but the principals and the sporting coaches and the parents and the, 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 the totality of the school, school community can be assisted to come together for a conversation about the fact that we have a cultural problem in the school and we need to transform the culture of the school so there is less violence going on between boys and girls and boys are being more respectful towards girls and, 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 and vice versa. Blame the victim behaviour needs to stop. There needs to be acknowledgement that if you perpetrate violence uh, against another, another child, that that is something that we are all concerned about and that all children will speak up about when they see it happen in the playground. So, so the restorative justice conference 
in a sort of a bullying playground, bullying context can be more than about just uh, repairing the harm to the, to the victim and changing the behaviour of the bully so that the bully stops being a, a, a bully thenceforth. It, it, it can be further about changing the culture of the school in practical ways so that other children are also accepting that they have some responsibility uh, for what uh, happened. Uh, so that they're speaking up at the conference and say, well, I saw this little kid being beat up by this bigger kid and I'm bigger than both of them. So, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a leader, respected as a leader in this uh, uh, school. So I have the capacity to intervene and say, hey, stop, stop picking on that kid. And I didn't. And that's something I'm ashamed of, that I, I should have exercised my responsibility as a more senior student in the school community. So he's trying to transform the culture of the school through restorative justice so that all children feel that they have a responsibility for violence pre prevention and protecting the rights of younger children. Uh, here in Australia, as in Ireland and the United States and many other countries, we've, we've had scandals in the, in the Catholic Church about sexual abuse of children uh, by priests and other other people involved in the uh, in the church, and then more recently in Australia, with those scandals have multiplied. They've affected to uh, they've affected other other churches. There's also been uh, scandals, follow up scandals about uh, sexual abuse of children in the state care of state institutions. So in Australia, a royal commission has been. Uh, put in place to inquire as to what might be done, and there'll be restorative uh, processes in re in relation uh, to the Royal Commission. Similarly, in our Defence Force, we've had a, a, a situation where there have been a, a sequence of serious allegations of uh, young people in the Defence Forces, particularly young women, uh, being subjected to sexual abuse filming them in the, in the shower, all sorts of uh, uh, abuses of uh, young women in the Defence Force and, and there's, a, uh, there's a commission on that topic as well. And there will be restorative justice processes in what has become thousands of cases in the Australian Defence Force going back over many years where people have come forward and said that they have been sexually abused in the in the past so there's a big challenge in managing uh, that uh, that process but for mine this is a a very healthy uh, development in Australian justice because of this institutional transformation point so it's important that we deal with uh, that grievance of that officer on that submarine as to a sexual abuse to which uh, she has been subject. But it's also important that we deal with the whole culture of that submarine, the whole culture of that ship that allows that to happen. In that sense, it's like the, the high school example. Uh, similarly, in the Catholic Church, it's important that we, that we deal with the problems in, a, in particular religious orders in terms of the culture of that religious orders, in terms of the culture of that parish, so that parish by parish, order by order, church by church, denomination by denomination, ship by ship, Navy, Army, Air Force, we have a sort of a long march through the institutions, high school by high school, so that one institution after another, we have a transformation of Australian culture so that it becomes a more restorative Australian culture and one which is, which is less tolerant of sexual abuse of less powerful people uh, in, in, in situations where you have uh, more powerful actors with authority over them, such as military officers or priests. Citizens in contemporary Western democracies are, are jaded and cynical about democracy. 
partly a function of the, the size of uh, societies these days. There was once a time when a lot of people would know their local member of parliament. These days, electorates are very large. Uh, politics is a more remote and professionalised uh, uh, game. And it is a game, and that's part of what makes uh, people cynical too. And it's a game that ordinary people no longer feel genuinely engaged with. One of the paradoxes of, of uh, restorative justice and, and democracy is that it, it opens up when, when we think about it, well, how are we going to fix that problem? How are we going to enrich uh, our, reinvigorate our democracy? And most people think about the uh, executive branch, the legisl legislative branch of governance as the places that you would do it, our engagement with our parliaments and, and so on. But actually, it may be the case that the best opportunity for reinvigorating citizens' active engagement with their democracy is through the, legis uh, through the judicial branch of governance. That is to say, when you're affected by, or your family is affected by a criminal offence, you have this intense interest in engaging uh, with the, uh, the offence. Let's come at the problem with a with another way, I'm a criminologist, and so uh, when the local police officer comes around, sends notices around, say, please come along to neighbourhood watch meetings, I, I tend to feel a bit guilty because I'm a criminologist. I think, well, that's the sort of thing I probably should show up for and be a good citizen and show an interest in. But most of us don't, of course. Uh, life is busy. There are lots of things to do, so we don't show up. If, on the other hand, the child who lives next door to me comes to me and says, Mr Braithwaite, I've been in trouble with the police. The police have said to me that I need to ask some people who I, from the neighbourhood, who I trust and who might come along to support me in a restorative justice conference. And I really get on well with you and I, I know you're well respected in the community. I'd like, uh, would, you, would you come along? Uh, to my conference to support me at the, at the conference. Well, I am going to say yes to that. So why am I going to say yes to that as I say no to the police officer who invites me along uh, to the neighbourhood watch meeting? Well, I say yes to the child next door because I'm honoured by the approach. I'm honoured by the fact that he has said to me that I'm a person who he feels a special relationship of uh, trust with. So you're building community and you're building democracy through an individual centred communitarianism. Uh, so people will participate democratically uh, much more vigorously uh, with decisions in the, in, in, in the judicial branch of governance if the judiciary will just devolve some of the uh, decision making to citizens who are, who are directly affected by the justice process. And, and, and that becomes possible on a larger scale where you have institutional transformation occurring in restorative justice, transformation of the, of the defence force so that there is less sexual abuse going on, transformation of, of churches. And this, if, we're, uh, if we're a parishioner in a particular church, this is something that might be very important to us and that therefore we will engage with that individual-centred communitarianism that arises from the shock and outrage over a particular incident of sexual abuse in the, in the parish. Well, both the O.J. Simpson case and the Travorn Martin case in the United States were connected to the politics of race and allegations of, of, of racism. And they also had in common uh, the, the fact that there was a criminal trial which resulted in, a, in an acquittal, a not guilty finding, followed by the family being very dissatisfied with that result uh, and moving on to a civil process which found that the offence did occur. And the reason for that difference being a not uncommon thing to happen in, is in a criminal trial you have to prove guilt beyond reasonable doubt. Whereas in the civil trial, 
you're proving it on the balance of, of probabilities. So O.J. Simpson was accused, famous black American footballer, was accused of murdering his white wife, acquitted in, the, in a long criminal trial, and then the civil uh, process found that he was uh, guilty of committing the, uh, the murder. Similarly with Trevorn Martin, he was a, uh, he was a young uh, black man who was wandering around wearing a hoodie, so he was stigmatised as a, a criminal by this uh, gentleman from the local neighbourhood watch who, 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 who shot him. Uh, so he was uh, prosecuted for murder, for shooting him without, uh, without good reason for discharging the firearm. He was acquitted of that. And then again, you had this moving on to a civil, uh, civil process. So it's unsatisfactory because you end up with a situation where the alleged criminal says, well, I've been found innocent of these particular charges, so I am innocent. But the family points to the case where they won in the civil process and say, well, that there was guilt. So that there's no coming to terms between the two parties. There's no clear admission of, of wrongdoing. And these are important cases because of the politics of, of race. And while President Obama did a good job in the Trevor Martin case in talking to the American people about the politics of race at the same time as emphasising the importance of protecting the rights of the, of, of the defendant, you end up with this situation. In both these cases, you ended up with a situation where most black people in America had a view about the case which was very opposed to the view of most white people uh, in America. They took the side of their, you know, the member of their same racial group and in reverse cases where in one case the alleged perpetrator was white, in the other case the alleged perpetrator was, uh, uh, was, was, was black. Well, you don't want a justice system that delivers you a politics of race of that kind. You want a justice system which uh, allows and encourages people to admit that, you know, where there, there, there is a racial problem to confront here, uh, where the, the man who shot Trevorn Martin is coming out and saying, I have to confess. I, I mean, I thought he was a criminal, but I have to confess that I was probably blinded by politics of race. Had he been a white young man, I would not have shot him. And that would have been, if that had happened in the justice process, it would have been a much more healing outcome for America than in fact the very divisive uh, outcome that occurred. Truth and Reconciliation Commissions after an armed conflict do make important contributions to rebuilding and restoring whole communities, whole nations. That's one of the lessons of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa, if you like, that it, it was part of what created a platform for great leaders like Nelson Mandela, Desmond Tutu, to restory the South African nation, to create a new narrative on what it meant to be a South African, so that uh, Mandela, through his restorative just gestures, such as sitting beside his jailers after his 27 years of imprisonment, sitting beside his jailers, inviting them along to his inauguration as president to sit beside him. This, is, this was an important reconciliatory gesture. And there was a lot of that. So what Mandela was doing was saying to the people of South Africa is whether you're black like me or white uh, like him, we have both been victims of this institution called, a, called apartheid. And that was the greatness of, uh, of Abraham Lincoln as well, 
in the Gettysburg Address, for example, where he's saying whether we are black or white, north or south, at the end of this civil war, we must now realise that we've all been victims of this terrible institution called slavery. And to be an American is to be someone who's involved in the national project of transcending slavery as a terrible institution that's afflicted our country and blighted our, 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 our history. So that, that macro part of restoration and reconciliation is very important in truth and reconciliation uh, commissions after armed conflicts. But what we've learnt from restorative justice in armed conflict now as well is that there's a lot of there's a lot more micro local stuff going on that's actually very important to healing the fabric of the country than the international relations commentators uh, want to see. So if we take a civil war like the civil, the independent civil war in Bougainville, where Bougainville was trying to separate uh, from uh, Papua New Guinea in the 1980s and, and, and 1990s, there's, as in all wars, there's a big geopolitical story about, uh, as to what the war was about. The war was about a politics of resource development this huge Australian mine in the middle of Bougainville where uh, there, was, there, was, there was conflict over who was getting the benefits of the mine. Was Australia getting the benefits of the mine? Was the central government in Port Moresby getting the benefits of the mine? And, and how much benefit were the local landowners uh, getting who were suffering terrible environmental destruction as a result of the ravages of the extraction? Uh, from the mine, and yes, sure, that was the big geopolitical story about what that what that civil war was about, and about independence as well, of course. But if you go to local villages, you might find that this chief took his people onto one side in, of the war versus the other so side of the war over something that happened between the two chiefs or their. Uh, or, or their forebears during World War II, where one group was on the Japanese side and the other group was on the US side. And there was never reconciliation between the two communities at the end of, at the end of World War II, so that when one side, when one chief took his people onto one side in the Civil War, the other chief saying, well, because he's on that side, we're going on the other side. And this is a chance to settle that score going right back to World War II. The more common scenario was the war became an opportunity for settling land disputes that had gone on for generations. So, okay, there's a war on, now's our chance to claim back this land by getting on the winning side and getting the land back that has always rightfully uh, uh, been part of the land of, uh, uh, of our village. So that restorative justice post-conflict in that Bougainville context had to be very critically about healing the, the hurts of the, the, the cycles of revenge that have occurred in the past over those land uh, disputes and actually getting a, a permanent settlement on the conflict over the, uh, over the land. Uh, healing the hurts of World War II. In other cases, allegations of sorcery were, were important. So you need to uh, not just read off a war in a village society as being about the, the big geopolitical narrative. You've got to deal with that through a reconciliation process that is more, more national between the major armies and political leaders involved, but you need that village-to-village -village reconciliation as well. And indeed, the Bougainvillians were, were very good at that, and uh, that, uh, we think is a reason for the resilience of the peace in Bougainville that's been accomplished so far. So consider the genocide in Rwanda, for which 800,000 people were killed, most of them hacked to death. There were so many people involved uh, in those crimes. There was a lot of pressure from the international community to do something after the event in terms of post-conflict justice because the interview, international community 
failed so badly to prevent the genocide. So 126,000 people were arrested and put in prison in, in Rwanda. A lot of these were children and they found, they quickly realised that the Rwandan criminal justice system, like any criminal justice system, just did not have the capacity to cope with 126,000 criminal cases or involving allegations of murder. So it's that system capacity problem where restorative justice has an important uh, contribution to make. And it was a very tragic way in post-conflict justice to learn that uh, lesson because most of these 126,000 offenders uh, sat in, in prison for seven, eight years uh, before their matter was dealt, dealt with, awaiting trials that just weren't occurring. And those who were getting trials because of the system capacity overload were generally getting trials where the judge was a second year law student, uh, for example, because there weren't enough trained uh, lawyers in the, in the country. The worst of it was that a lot of these 126,000 were innocent in the following sense. They may have been a child who was guilty of hacking another human being to death with a machete, but that may have occurred in the context where his brother uh, refused to kill another member of their village and as a result of his refusal to engage in the, uh, in the genocide, he was cut down and murdered. And then this child who stands charged of committing killings, which he indeed did commit, uh, was in a situation where if he didn't com commit the killings, he would be killed himself. So there was a huge plea in mitigation issue there, which would mean that most courts would be rather forgiving, especially a child uh, who was in that uh, situation, and they would have been released by any court in almost any part of the world without having to serve a, a prison time for that sort of situation. But a lot of these children died in prison of HIV AIDS because they were subject to sexual abuse in the, in the prison system. So what kind of justice uh, is involved in that? There was a realisation in Rwanda uh, that another path was needed. So they moved over to a more traditional form of what they call gachacha justice, justice on the hill, a more village style of indigenous justice where they could get these large numbers of people who'd been awaiting trial for eight years, get their, 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 their case process more quickly in a more restorative justice uh, uh, justice process so that as in the traditional uh, you know day-to-day -day criminal law matters it's not that restorative justice has all the answers restorative justice is a complement uh, to formal criminal law in a case like uh, Rwanda you do need the capacity to prosecute criminally before the courts the generals, the political leaders who were responsible for leading uh, the genocide. That's important that that be done with the checks and balances and with the high profile that, uh, that uh, international criminal tribunals uh, do, uh, do have to offer, whether they're run nationally or whether they're run uh, in, internationally in, in The Hague. But there's never the capacity to deal with 126,000 cases that way. So you need that complementary role where most of the hard yards are actually being done by restorative justice work. And, and that's true in a, at a, in a lower level uh, with day-to-day -day criminal justice. It's important when any crime occurs that there is a response. It's not good enough for the criminal justice system to say, oh, because this is a, this is a this is a minor matter, we're going to ignore it. Uh, any breach of the criminal law requires a response from the community. It might be that the community is saying, well, this is a juvenile offender, it's not a very serious matter. Mum and dad 
uh, can deal with it by sitting down with the child and talking through as a family uh, with why what was done was wrong, was it shoplifting, uh, what should be done in terms of returning the goods to the store or paying some compensation to the store owner. The family can do all that stuff itself. But the important thing is that it's not ignored because if it's ignored, the lesson will be given, well, we don't take crime seriously until crime becomes a really serious matter. And then by that stage, it can be more difficult uh, to, uh, uh, to, to do something about long run prevention. And that's true with the prevention of genocide as well, that the society needs to have a response that takes any kind of inter-ethnic rioting, violence seriously and has, even, even if there is not the evidence to convict anyone involved in the riot of a, of a, of a criminal offence, there needs to be a restorative justice process that says this is a terrible thing to be happening in our society that different ethnic groups are attacking each other, fighting each other in the streets or burning down each other's homes. So the Nuremberg trials after World War II were, were very important. They were a breakthrough. They were about the international community saying that criminal justice, international criminal justice, has a role here. And if there is criminal behaviour that's occurred by the leadership, military or politically of a particular country, there should be a trial and there should be convictions. It wasn't totally positive uh, in the sense that the German people, the survey research uh, evidence, and we see this in the work of Susanna Karstedt, for example, German scholar, the survey research from the late 1940s and 1950s in, in Germany shows that the German people interpreted the Nuremberg trials as showing that there was this little coterie of bad guys very evil guys around Hitler. It was uh, Hitler's inner circle, it was the leadership of the SS, but the German army, for example, did not, you know, our boys in the German army did nothing uh, wrong. There was not a recognition that the German judiciary as an institution had been completely corrupted by fascism and played a terrible role in allowing uh, genocide and all sorts of other uh, abuses of human rights to occur. That changed in Germany in the 1960s and it changed, Karstedt's work shows, uh, because of the Eichmann trial. And where the Eichmann trial was different uh, in 1960 from the uh, Nuremberg trials of the 1940s is that there was victim, and, there was victim testimony. Uh, the trial occurred in, uh, in Israel. Victims came forward and gave testimonies had the opportunity to tell their stories so that international courtroom justice can also be more or less uh, restorative. The Nuremberg trials were based on documentary records of you know, what was happening in the gas chambers and so on, and that was quite sufficient uh, to convict uh, those who were responsible for running those, uh, those death camps. But the, but the Eichmann trial brought the stories of the suffering of the victims to life, empowered the victims to give testimony in the trial. So that the Eichmann trial was the turning point in the German people saying, oh no, there was a more widespread problem here. So what's happened in, in Germany, of course you've, you've had wonderful reconciliation in Europe where through their participation in the European community, Germany, France, Britain uh, uh, are very close partners in democratic uh, coexistence and it's hard to imagine another major world war breaking out in Europe there. So the reconciliation has been successful there but it was necessary for a fairly long process. So in the long, in the long durée, uh, those who are on the uh, side of uh, war crimes having occurred have to hear the stories of victims. And that's been even slower the other way because of course there were uh, war crimes uh, in the other direction. There was the bombing of, of Dresden, the fire bombing of Dresden, the needless uh, destruction of large numbers of citizens 
which was also true in the firebombing of, of Tokyo. And it was important uh, for the Allied uh, powers to, uh, to, to hear those stories of victimisation. And that's, become, that's been even slower in coming. But that macro reconciliation is a, is a, is a very important. So there, there's, a, there's an important restorative uh, part of the story of what it is we need to do to learn the last the lessons of the last war to prevent the the next war whether it's in the village learning that we have to settle sort out our little land dispute or whether it's uh, uh, germany and britain realizing that we need to issue some statement of apology for the bombing of dresden in every country there are strong supporters of restorative justice from within the the legal profession and, and strong opponents who see it as a as a threat uh, to just I mean the, the important thing there is that we're evidence based about it so that uh, restorative justice advocates are involved in a conversation with the legal profession about the evidence so it's not a matter of saying oh you you in the legal profession are obsessed with uh, with rights uh, people who are advocates of restorative justice have to be very concerned about, about rights, have to be very concerned about the reality that at times rights are abused in restorative justice processes. And, and, and we've got to be evidence-based about how we design, redesign restorative justice so it becomes, so it experiences continuous improvement in becoming more and more rights respecting. And then, I mean, the evidence is encouraging, as I mentioned earlier, that, that uh, uh, people randomly assigned to restorative justice conferences report that they feel their rights were um, better protected than when they're randomly assigned to a court case, even here in Canberra, where our judiciary is a very, our court system is a very rights respecting uh, court system. So there's reason to be encouraged about the possibility of that kind of evidence based conversation uh, with, the, with the legal community. It's an interesting question, though, in the sense that uh, in the countries where the leadership for restorative justice has very much been from uh, the legal profession, uh, the development of restorative justice has had uh, more momentum. So getting uh, allies of restorative justice from within the, the legal profession itself is, is very important. We've suffered uh, from that here in Australia where there have not been uh, many high profile judicial advocates of restorative justice, whereas next door in New Zealand, uh, they have a more widespread restorative justice program because the key advocates for restorative justice have been senior judges. We've seen that in England as well with the Lord Chief Justice. Uh, Lord Chief Justice Wolfe was a very public uh, advocate for restorative justice and also in Canada where we've had senior judges uh, who, who, are, who are advocates. So how do we get from where we are here in Australia to where they are there? I, I think one of the ways is through encouraging uh, influential lawyers to sit in on restorative justice conferences. Because one of the things we know statistically about restorative justice is that 90% of the time when people walk out of a restorative justice conference that they've sat through, they are impressed. They, 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 they give high satisfaction ratings to the quality of the justice that they've seen unfold in the room, higher than they do when they sit in on a, uh, on, on a court case. So the, again, in that regard, uh, the evidence is, is on our side. Same with politicians. As one regularly does, you, you encounter politicians who say, this is a soft option. I'm, I stand at the last election and I stood for being tough on crime and this sounds like a way of being soft on, on crime. So you say to them, well, we think it's actually really hard uh, for the uh, offender to go through uh, this. So we'd like you to come along and sit in on a conference and talk to the offender afterwards, talk to their family afterwards, talk to the victim, ask the victim if they're satisfied. And again, we know statistically there's that 90% uh, chance that that's how it'll turn out. 
Unfortunately, it doesn't always work because 10% of the time, uh, the conference, uh, uh, probably more than 10% of the time, the conference goes badly in some important uh, way and, uh, and, and that lawyer, that politician becomes a more entrenched enemy of, uh, of restorative justice. But you play the odds on the, on the politics of restorative justice in that way. And in terms of the mass participation support, the numbers are also on your side. If you know that 80 to 90 percent of ordinary people who sit in on a restorative justice conference program are impressed with the quality of the justice, as the program builds over time, if you have an average of eight or nine people attending a conference, which has been the situation here in, in this town, by the time you've had a thousand, run a thousand conferences, you've had eight or 9,000 people in the city who've experienced this kind of justice and 80 to 90% of them are gonna be impressed or more than 90% of them sometimes are gonna be impressed with, with what they've seen. And then you get community pressure on politicians saying, well, you know, we really don't want you to, to shut this down. So in New Zealand, they've been very good at this and the, uh, the most right-wing uh, political parties, the pro-family, parties, because it's a pro-family process, uh, have been very supportive uh, of restorative uh, justice. So that there's been support from the left and the right of politics that's, a, that's been accomplished by inviting people to just come along, sit in and talk through with the stakeholders about whether they like what's happened or not. It's been surprising how quickly restorative justice has spread around the world, particularly since the 2000 United Nations Conference on the Prevention of Crime and Treatment Offenders, where, again, surprisingly, all countries voted at the United Nations Congress for investing in restorative justice as a complement uh, to uh, their justice systems. And as far as I know, uh, every nation that I know of has actually implemented that decision. There, there, there may be. A couple of countries out there where it hasn't happened, but I'm not aware of uh, which those countries are. And certainly in the major uh, uh, economies in, in China, for example, you have about 7 million <laughs> criminal mediation cases occurring every year. In the United States, restorative justice is not mainstreamed in the way that it is, say, in the juvenile justice system of New Zealand or other small countries like uh, Austria, Norway, where you have a, a, a great deal of restorative justice uh, going on. But in the United States, there, there are more than a thousand local programs. Every state uh, uh, has a, a, a number. They're just mostly fairly small. A country like Canada, you've got, uh, you've got more than 400 restorative justice programs in Australia, in, in every state and territory, we, we have fairly significant sized restorative justice uh, programs these days. But in no country has restorative justice yet become the mainstream of the justice system. I don't think that's something to worry about. I think all countries need to be on their own journey of discovery as to how to get a balance that works for them between what kind of cases go to formal criminal justice and, and, and what kind go to, uh, to restorative justice. Restorative justice has also become increasingly widespread in schools for doing with, dealing with problems like school bullying. In fact, there's more restorative justice going on around in the world's schools uh, than there is uh, in the world's uh, criminal justice system. And in matters like child protection, in many countries, there's a great deal of restorative justice uh, being deployed uh, to respond to problems like child neglect and child abuse in families through family group conferences. Yeah, the evidence is, is encouraging that restorative justice is more successful than the justice of courtrooms in bringing offenders out to the point where they are willing to apologise and express remorse and experience remorse indeed for what they've done. That's what the research uh, evidence suggests. More than that, uh, in our cases, 
uh, in uh, Canberra that were randomly assigned to restorative justice versus the courts, not only did more of the victim, a much higher percentage of the victims in cases that went to restorative justice conference say that they got an apology, they were also m more likely to believe that the apology was sincere when it was an apology uttered in the context of restorative justice conference compared with a with a with a with an apology expressed in the context of a uh, of a court case. So that, yeah, the evidence is encouraging on responsibility in that regard. But responsibility in and in, in restorative justice is not just about the responsibility of the offender. And it's also about a, a different conception of responsibility from the kind of responsibility we see in a, in a, in a, in a criminal trial. But a traditional criminal trial is about passive responsibility. It's about holding the offender responsible for something they have done in the past. So it's backward looking. Restorative justice accountability is active responsibility that is forward looking. It's about inviting stakeholders in the injustice to take responsibility for putting things right into the future. So restorative justice responsibility we think is more effective firstly because it's active rather than passive. People are choosing to take on that responsibility as in that uncle who will invite a child to come and live in that family who will ensure uh, that the offender attends the anger management course and so on. Active responsibility and the fact that it's forward looking for putting things right into the future rather than a backward looking responsibility which is the model of responsibility of the traditional criminal trial. That's not to say that accountability often does fail in restorative justice conferences. You'll see a, a young person in the restorative circle where, you know, really terrible things that they've done to another human being have come out uh, in, the, in the conference. And there they are looking down at their shoes, not making any eye contact uh, with the person that they've done to or the, or the family or, or to their own uh, family. And they're sort of, they're, they're cutting themselves off they, they also have a shield that's up sort of protecting themselves from any, any shame. And <laughs> that's one of the reasons why they are criminal offenders, because they are very good at protecting themselves from experiencing shame for wrongdoing, at, at, at protecting them from a sense that they have to take responsibility for their, for their actions. That's why they commit offence after offence. So how does one, what's the strategy? of a restorative justice conference for getting behind that shield of shame. Well, the clue comes when we think about restorative justice and our conferences, when I've seen many conferences where this sort of thing has happened, that the victim will be describing, telling their story about how they've suffered. Uh, you know, the elderly woman who says, you think that you just broke into my house to steal $50, but I want you to understand that that $50 is nothing to me. What's important to me is that I no longer feel safe in my own house. And that's what you did to me. You took away from me that fear as an old person who feels frail and vulnerable. I now have this sense that at any time, anyone could break into my house and put me and my things. Uh, at risk, and the young person is looking down and not not moved at all by what uh, any human being would 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 normally see as as extremely moving testimony. But what happens then is that the 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 young offender's mother, who is sitting beside him, begins to sob because she is absolutely moved and uh, overcome by a sense of disappointment that this is, you know, her own family has afflicted this on this, this poor woman. But then it's his mother's sobbing rather than the victim's direct experience, which is the thing that gets behind his shield of shame, that is, it's his mother who can uh, connect to his 
experience of feeling responsibility that yes I am responsible for the fact that my mother is sobbing I am the one that caused her to be upset so that's the collective emotional dynamics of the conference is very important and Meredith uh, Rosner's research in her 2013 book on the emotional dynamics of restorative justice conference shows that mothers are very important uh, in these processes uh, in, in our research here in Canberra, led by uh, Sherman and Strang, uh, they uh, found that uh, women actually talk somewhat more of the time than men do in restorative justice conferences, which is the opposite to the percentage of air time that the two sexes have in a criminal trial. It's mostly men who are getting most of the air time in a criminal uh, trial, mostly more powerful and the reverse is, is slightly true with restorative justice. But more importantly than that, Meredith Rosner found that the emotional turning points in conferences are more often the result of the emotional work of female participants in the conference than, uh, than male. So, so this gender democratising of the justice process that gives more space for uh, women to be empowered in in conferences is very important. It's, it's also important in accountability of other actors. Remember, restorative justice is about multiple levels of re active responsibility and accountability. So I've been in really interesting conferences where mums have spoken up and taken some young police officer to task and said to him, it was absolutely an unnecessary for you to rough up my son the way you did when you arrested him. He's done the wrong thing. He's come along here and admitted that he's done the, the wrong thing. W was it really necessary for you to strike him uh, on, the, on, on the head as you pushed him? In, you know? uh, so accountability for the, for, for the police. And of course, when the police behave badly in the criminal justice uh, process, that can become a technique of, of, of neutralisation. That can be one of the ways in which uh, a, a, a young offender condemns the condemners. You know, I'm not so bad because I'm not as bad as you. You who, you who are, I condemn you who are condemning me, and that's a way of abrogating responsibility. So that through having a process where everyone can talk with, without coercion about the different ways in which they see uh, there being an important accountability story that needs to be sorted through uh, in the in the in the conversation that you you've got more more hope for active responsibility of the offenders there have been a lot of evaluation studies uh, now probably more than a hundred of the effectiveness the impact of restorative justice on on crime of different uh, kinds uh, in the uh, mid 2000s the Canadian Department of Justice combined the results from studies that had higher uh, methodological standards. They combined data from 32 studies to see whether overall uh, there was an impact in reducing crime of cases that went to restorative justice versus cases that went to a control group. They did find a statistically significant effect. There was another follow-up study by the Canadian Department of Justice a few years later with some more cases added in, and again, they found a, a statistically significant uh, result. But it wasn't a big effect size. It was a modest uh, effect size. And within uh, those 32 studies, there were, there were quite a number of studies where there was no effect, and in fact, a, a counter, even a counterproductive uh, effect, including on the, in the experiments we did in Canberra, there were there was the, some of the restorative justice ex ex experiments were backfired. So it's not a consistent picture. It's early days, even though so many studies uh, ha have been done. Uh, last year, we had uh, Don Weatherburn of the New South Wales Bureau of Crime Statistics and Research publishing a piece in the Australian New Zealand Journal of Criminology where he looked back at those Canadian meta-analyses and says, Oh, I don't think they're all that convincing. They're pretty weak uh, effect sizes. Okay, they're statistically significant, but they're not, uh, they're not strong in, in reducing reoffending. 
And then he looked at uh, 14 studies that have been done since there, and only six out of the 14 had found a statistically significant effect. So he published a, an article arguing, well, uh, this is really uh, not very convincing. My own reading of that uh, uh, literature up to that point is that, uh, uh, you know, six out of 14 is, is really not so different uh, from the uh, 36, 37 studies that had been done uh, up to uh, up to 2007 when his follow-up occurred. So I think we've got the same overall pattern, but I think he's right to say that there's, there's, there's this weak uh, overall effect. What we've got is a number of studies where we have quite potent effects. So here in Canberra on uh, the moderately serious violence offences, we, we, we have uh, a, around a 40% reduction in re-offending on the cases randomly, violence cases, uh, randomly assigned to restorative justice. That's a big effect. And then we have these other studies with, uh, with no effect. It, it seems uh, that uh, restorative justice is more effective uh, with the more serious uh, offences. Uh, where the victimisation is more terrible and, and, and more effective with violence uh, offences. It's not effective uh, in, uh, for example, with, with drink driving as a result of random breath tests. It was not effective here in Canberra because there was not that emotional engagement with a victim where you just picked up on a random uh, breath test. And uh, very often, it was ineffective for minor examples of shoplifting, for example, which again is not too surprising with the emotional dynamics of the conference if you've got the victim is actually the store security guy who comes along as the victim to the conference. You get these uh, young people who turn up the conference and has the attitude that, well, you're making a living out of my crime and you're hardly a victim. So the emotional Dynamics of uh, learning to empathise with the victim can often uh, work uh, badly, even counterproductively, in those uh, in those cases. So we're learning about how to design and how to focus uh, restorative justice processes so they have a a better statistical record. The other important uh, thing to say is we've always uh, said. Uh, those of us who work on this topic, that we would expect the effect of a single 90-minute conference to be quite limited, especially with the follow-ups that we're now doing here in Canberra 10 years on. Would you really expect a big statistical effect of something that happened 10 years ago and went for 90 minutes in your life when all sorts of other things have happened in your in your life uh, 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 in between. So in that sense, it's surprising that you get a, a statistically significant uh, effect uh, overall. Uh, and, and that's the reason why you need a, a meta-analysis approach where you com combine cases from many studies so that you get the statistical power in your analysis through, uh, through, uh, through aggregating many cases. That meta-analysis that was done uh, by Dowda, Dowden, Latimer and Muse for the Canadian Department of Justice, while the effect in reducing reoffending was statistically significant, it was modest. But was, what was a very powerful effect of restorative justice compared to control groups who went to court and were dealt with in more conventional ways was on implementing what was agreed. This is a very counterintuitive finding that uh, if a, uh, a court orders the offender to pay compensation to the victim, if a court orders community service work or attendance at a drug rehabilitation program, you would expect that that would be more likely to be complied with. Because if you don't comply with it, you're, you're in contempt of court, and that's a second criminal offence. Whereas if you don't comply with what's agreed uh, in, a, in a restorative justice conference, they're, they're, you know, that has no legal standing. 
you are not defying an order of the court. You are just defining, uh, an, defying an informal agreement that a bunch of citizens have signed saying, I agree to go along to, the, uh, to, the, to pay this money and to go along uh, to this uh, program if you don't uh, do it. But the empirical result in that meta-analysis is that you're much more likely uh, to implement the agreement if it's uh, settled in a restorative justice conference. So why is that? Well, it's, it's because, uh, you know, Uncle Harry's are much more effective in following up compliance with what's agreed than the police are with uh, uh, checking that you're not in contempt of court. The police have, in fact, a lot more important things to do than to check whether you're showing up uh, to your rehabilitation program or whether you've made your final compensation payment and so on. But families who, who, who have a sense of responsibility and remorse for what has happened do have that capacity to follow through and make sure that their family member uh, meets their obligations under the agreement. And that's why you get, you, you get much higher compliance with the conference agreement in restorative justice than you do uh, with the court order. Now this intersects with the research evidence on the effectiveness. So a lot of us think that the reason that restorative justice is more effective than the alternatives as a crime prevention strategy is that it's a more effective delivery vehicle. So if anger management programs work, if drug rehabilitation programs work, then through getting commitment to them through a restorative justice conference, we're more likely to get them actually completed and happening than if a judge tells you, sentences you, uh, to tell you that they, uh, they must be done. But if on the other hand, the restorative justice process decides to uh, uh, persuade you to do something that's counterproductive, like you know, in the criminological literature, there's a lot of evidence that boot camps are counterproductive. They don't, uh, you know, sending kids who have misbehaved off to boot camp, the, the theory uh, is that this will toughen them up and bring about a life change. In fact, it more often uh, brings out resentments uh, and out of those resentments, they connect them up to a sort of criminal subcultures of kids who uh, uh, feel that they're outcast in the way that they're treated by the boot camp program. And it facilitates this forming of a little society of, of outcasts who give each other mutual reinforcement for a criminal subculture of opposition to what the boot camp is asking them to do. So they don't work. They don't work. In fact, they make uh, they increase, send kids off to boot camp, it increases uh, uh, reoffending. So that if the restorative justice conference is persuading kids to go right through with the, uh, persuading their families to make sure they go through the, uh, the, the, the boot camp process, then the restorative justice process paradoxically will be more effective in getting the child to do something that is actually counterproductive. So that's why you can sometimes get these counterproductive rates. If, if what's being agreed by the restorative justice uh, conference is actually uh, harmful and you're getting more delivery of that harmful uh, result than in the court case, then uh, restorative justice will increase reoffending. So it follows from what I've just said that uh, uh, restorative justice outcomes, when they do go bad, they can go very bad. So that, for example, we had a, a conference here in Canberra after a, a minor shoplifting offence where the mother of this child proposed to the conference that it would be a good idea for him to turn up at the shopping centre with a T-shirt that said, emblazoned with, I am a thief. And this was actually carried out and there was a lot of publicity uh, surrounding it, uh, a very misconceived way of thinking about how shame should operate in restorative justice, the topic we'll come to later, but a, but a very a counterproductive thing that because it happens with community engagement and a, and a lot of profile there out in the public space of the mall uh, 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 can be more counterproductive than 
anything of that kind that might uh, happen in a, in a courtroom. I mentioned before that the evidence is that uh, victims uh, statistically overall experience a reduction in, in fear, uh, feeling safer, feeling less punitive toward their offender as a result of the conference and feeling that their rights as victims have been respected. They're more likely to feel that in a restorative justice conference than in a court case. But in, for a minority of victims, they're much worse off. You know, they're worse off in cases. I remember a case in, in, in Canberra which was an assault of a young man by bouncers at a nightclub in Canberra. And what, what happened is that uh, there were three bouncers involved and two of the bouncers had prior offences. They, so they conspired with each other for the third younger bouncer to put up his hand and say, well, I did it. I'm the one who you know, knocked him about uh, in this way and in the assault. So when it came to the Restorative Justice Conference, the victim says, no, it wasn't you. You didn't do that to me. That was, it, was, it was the other big, big guy who did that to me. So the victim's then very angry uh, as a result of a conference of of that kind. So as in the justice of the courts, so with restorative justice, you've got to get the nuts and bolts of getting the justice uh, uh, right uh, done as well. Another very counterproductive uh, conference for a victim that we had in Canberra was in the early days of restorative justice uh, here. It was a serious case in which a, a, a young man who was a heroin addict uh, threatened uh, a woman with a syringe. In the conference, the woman got very angry, uh, very abusive uh, toward the young man. He got abusive back to her. So it was one of those minority of conferences that spun into a very negative uh, anger dynamic. The conference broke up without a satisfactory uh, resolution. The conference facilitator did not do a very good job of it. What happened uh, in the course of the next week? This woman uh, uh, unlocked her car, went into the car, and there was a syringe skewered into the dashboard of her car uh, with the obvious intent of terrorising the woman. So here was a, a, a victim who, as a result of the restorative justice process, far from being healed, her anger got worse, uh, her sense of safety from living in the, uh, in, in the community deteriorated. So, and that's a risk with, uh, with criminal trials uh, as well. Uh, I mean, victims and witnesses uh, do get murdered at times in the process of, uh, of criminal trials. Uh, thankfully, that hasn't happened uh, in any restorative justice process that I know of, but, but comparable things do happen, such as the terrible story that I've just told. So think about restorative justice in relation to the Taliban in Afghanistan, Pakistan. David Kilcullen has a very interesting analysis of how the Taliban came to power. They came to power in Kandahar in southern Afghanistan because this was a part of Afghanistan where there was no rule of law, where there was total disorder in the years after the collapse of the former communist regime uh, in, a, in Afghanistan. And what you had was competing warlords fighting for space, uh, setting up checkpoints along the road. So when the poor old farmer would uh, take uh, his truckload of melons along the road. Different militants would stop him at different points on the way to the market, demand payments. There were also a lot of women uh, being raped and harassed by these young bands of militants. So the Taliban came along and put a stop to this, in effect, through an oppressive form, putting in place an oppressive form of of Sharia law. It shut down the checkpoints so the farmer could drive, drive straight to the uh, market. It cracked down uh, in a very punitive way 
on uh, young uh, gang members who are engaging in sexual offences against women. So at first the Taliban were popular uh, for doing this. So Kilcullen says that they came to power as an armed rule of law movement, that where there's a rule of law vacuum uh, in a society, there's a challenge that creates an opportunity uh, for uh, terrorist groups to, uh, to, come, to come to power. So we've been working on a restorative justice program with the uh, uh, Pakistan police in areas of the northwest of Pakistan where there is a substantial uh, Taliban influence and power and competition. And these are areas where the court system is not working. A, a similar story to that story in the South. So again, the Taliban is saying, well, we will offer you the Taliban courts and we will bring, uh, we will bring order. So what we're doing with this project is uh, seeking to uh, use uh, through the training that uh, great Pakistani restorative justice uh, leader Ali Goha has provided in training uh, citizens to use traditional yoga restorative uh, processes, but to locate them behind the walls of a police station. Uh, police stations in that part of Pakistan have high walls with uh, gentlemen with machine guns on turrets on the top because of uh, attacks by the Taliban on, on police stations are common. But this means that if the restorative justice conference, if the jirga is held uh, behind the walls of the police station, they can't be targeted by the Taliban. And the problem is that when a competing traditional justice system gets out there offering a real alternative to the Taliban courts, they send the suicide bomber along, they, uh, they start shooting at the people who turn up. So people stop coming, people give up on their traditional restorative forms of justice, and then the justice of the courts can't cope with the workload they have, and the Taliban have that uh, opportunity to, to come in. So this has been, quite an effective program and very important to do because in a revenge and honour culture as Pakhtun culture is in this part of the, of the world, if a member of your family is killed by someone from my family, you must kill someone from my family and then when you kill someone from my family, I must kill another person from your family and this go, just keeps going on and on until the elders bring a traditional process, Jirga process, together to say, we must have a settlement between these two families, between these two clans, between these two tribes, between these two villages to, uh, to bring an end to the cycle of, uh, of violence. So these uh, hybrid restorative justice, traditional Jirga in the circle conducted by the elders with one police officer uh, in attendance occurring within the walls of the police station have allowed the ending in our research we've found uh, many cases of cycles of violence in which dozens of people were being killed which have been brought to an end. So this is a different kind of qualitative effectiveness from a revenge culture uh, where through ending the cycles of revenge you can substantially reduce the homicide rate in a conflict area. And by making the area safer, you create more opportunity for the state to govern democratically and reduce the opp opportunity space uh, for the Taliban to take over. And it's just a, um, a pickup of the general result that we have in the evaluation research on punitiveness that after a restorative justice conference, people give up, are more likely to give up on revenge. In fact, here in the uh, uh, Sh uh, Sherman and Strang uh, research in Canberra, that was the biggest effect in the data that after cases randomly assigned to court, 46% of the time here in Genteel Canberra, victims were saying, if I had a chance to get back at him, for what he did to me, I'd like to take it. 46% of the time they're saying that. 
but they're saying that only 6% of the time after restorative justice, after the case randomly assigned to restorative justice. So you get a, you're getting a big reduction of punitiveness. That's a, that's a great thing in the context of Canberra, but in the context of the northwest of Pakistan, where you're trying to hold off uh, the, the country from spinning into a civil, civil war, it's absolutely imperative that one brings an end to the cycles of violence that create a seedbed uh, for fundamentalism. My book, Crime, Shame and Reintegration, is about the idea that societies where crime is not shameful have high crime rates. Does it follow from that that what we need is restorative justice conferences where people say, shame on you for what you've done, or a t-shirt saying I am a thief? No, absolutely not. The way to communicate to, uh, shame in a restorative justice conference is a, a much more mundane process of that conversation where there's a requirement to listen to how the victim has suffered. There's a requirement to listen to what one's mother, family members, other loved ones have to say about uh, that suffering of the victim. And through coming to terms with the consequences, being more willing to recognise the consequences, feeling a feeling that of remorse uh, that one has done the wrong thing. Nathan Harris's uh, data shows that uh, it's when uh, remorse happens, when the offender feels that the participants in the conference with whom they have the very strongest relationships of love, when he, when he feels that those loved ones feel that what he did was wrong and that he has he has got that message from what they said at the conference that they really think he's done the wrong thing and should take responsibility for it. Now, it, it's not just, it, it, you know, when, when you have a fairly high degree of respect for another person, their disapproving of what you have done it does not produce that result. It's only the people we love a great deal. So this is why it's critically important to have in the room uh, those in the strongest relationship of care, respect, uh, uh, love. So I sort of jokingly refer to this as the all you need is love result. If you have people who really love you in the room and they're telling you, well, here, here's why I think uh, uh, this is the wrong thing and that there's a harm that needs to be repaired. That's a, but it's also, it also goes to why a judge or a police officer lecturing us does not work very well because they're not people. You know, the police officer who's lecturing us is not a person who we have a strong relationship of love and respect and, and, and trust for. And, and indeed, our data shows that with uh, uh, Aboriginal uh, young people in Canberra with, with whom restorative justice can be very counterproductive, it can be counterproductive in their context where a police officer is lecturing them and that's producing a, a, a defiance reaction. Yes, so I said the argument of crime, shame and reintegration is that, is that where crime is shameful, uh, in those societies they will have less, less crime. So think about particular kinds of crime. Here in Australia, uh, when I was young, it was not shameful to hop in a car and drive it after one had had a lot too much to drink. Today, uh, it is very shameful. My own children uh, have a very different attitude to the shamefulness of uh, drunk driving uh, than my peers did when I, when I was uh, a, a young person. And that's because of the way the campaign against uh, drink driving was done. Sure, we introduced uh, random breath testing and Ross Hommel's result shows that that was an effective policy reform, but a lot of its effectiveness was in the way it was done. So it was introduced with a television advertising campaign that had famous television stars saying, you know, be a mate if your friend has had too much to drink, scenes in the bar where say, come on, I'll drive you home. So 
communities of care caring from each other and preventing, helping to prevent each other from getting into trouble with the law. And, and the, those who you like and trust most in your friendship work saying to network saying to you, 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 you really must not do that. It's the wrong thing to do. It's, you know, it's, it's not what your girlfriend would want you to do and, and so on. So it's, it, that worked in constituting the shamefulness of drunk driving and, and as a result of that, we have thousands less people being killed on our roads every year because it really is less of a, less of a problem. Similarly, in a society where you know, young men see uh, nothing very wrong with sexual assault of young women, these will be societies that have a high uh, incidence of, of rape. So the important way uh, to uh, produce a society with a lower uh, rape rate is not really through micro restorative justice conferences, it's through having a women's movement that is telling the stories, perhaps telling the stories in conferences would be helpful at times, but telling the story in the wider culture as to why rape is shameful. And that's why the institution of a royal commission into sexual abuse in the, in the, in, in the churches and the state institutions is also a very powerful institution of reform because it can help uh, constitute the shamefulness of sexual assault. Data in the United States shows an association between the rise of the women's movement, women's uh, advocacy against rape and decline in the rape rate. The evidence that uh, locking up more rapists has done the work is, is very thin, but the politics of the women's movement in constituting the shamefulness of rape, according to the argument in that book, is, is uh, what's effective in doing the work of crime prevention. There are very different modalities of shame, different ways that shame is transacted in different cultures. One of the interesting things we've learned from Maori culture in New Zealand about shame, which they call whakama in their language, is that the kind of shame that they're concerned about is, is a in, in the way they, they look at Western criminal justice as barbaric, as a barbaric alternative in the way it thinks about shame and guilt. So they think of it as barbaric to have the offender sit or stand alone in, in the dock to have people make accusations for them. In their view, you must deal with the shame uh, of what you are accused of while you are surrounded by your loved ones. And that's, of course, a key uh, insight from uh, uh, Maori experience and Maori culture that the restorative justice movement has learned a great deal from, that criminal offenders should not have to deal with it standing alone. They should deal with it surrounded by their community of care. But in their way of thinking about whakamar, about the kind of shame a reaction that you would like to see happening in a criminal justice process. It's the shame that matters is not they, they, they see that Western person in the, in the dock as expected to have you know, individual guilt eating away at, the, at them. And they see that as a very dangerous, destructive form of shame. The kind of shame they are concerned about is the shame of uh, letting one's family down, the shame of letting one's extended family, the whanau, letting the whanau down, you, you, you've let them down. And the beauty of that kind of shame is that ex as soon as your extended family says to you, well, we accept now that you have put, uh, put things right and we in the family forgive you, then you transcend that shame. So it has a stronger built-in mechanism for terminating the shame. Uh, in the theory of crime, shame and reintegration, I'm concerned to make a difference, a distinction between stigmatising shaming and reintegrating shaming. And what I'm talking about there in Maori culture is a form of reintegrative shaming where the, where, where the shameful experience of having to confront the harm that you've done to another human being 
is terminated by a ritual of forgiveness from your extended family who pat you on the back and say, well, you met with the victim, you took your responsibility, and now you are fully reintegrated into the embrace of the family. That's part of what reintegrative shaming is about. And I think the, the Maori critique of Western justice is very apt here, that the, the, the Western criminal trial can be a degradation ceremony uh, that certifies your deviance, that tells you you are a criminal offender and therefore we solemnly pass this sentence at the end of the process. So the Western criminal trial process is a, is a degradation ceremony that certifies deviance, ending with the judge solemnly invoking a sentence which you will have to uh, serve. Uh, so part of the idea of reintegrative shaming is that, yes, ceremonies that certify deviance, that yeah, some wrongdoing has occurred here, must be terminated by ceremonies to decertify deviance. Now you are someone who has been through this uh, process, now you are reintegrated into the community of the law abiding. So that's part of the distinction between stigmatization, a stigmatizing shaming process. It's one that certifies you as a wrongdoer, but that pays no attention to another ritual to decertify you as someone who's embraced back into the, uh, into the, into the community. Secondly, uh, stigmatization is a form of shaming that's about the idea that you are a bad person who has done a bad thing. Whereas reintegrative shaming is about the idea that you are an essentially good person who has done a bad thing. So the disapproval of your bad act is communicated to you with a continuum, within a continuum of respect for you as a person, you are treated with dignity. Indeed, you will be treated by love, with love uh, from uh, your loved ones who are in attendance at a restorative justice uh, conference. And again, this takes us back to this distinction in the composition of the restorative justice conference between a community of care who's there to support you versus a criminal trial where the people on your team are not so much there to support you but they're there because they can inflict damage on the other side, just as they have a group of people who in their testimony will seek to inflict damage on your side of the, of, of, of the case. So that structurally, a restorative justice conference is more likely to induce a reintegrated form of shaming, and indeed the evidence uh, supports the fact that that is the case, whereas, uh, uh, particularly the worst design kinds of criminal trials are structurally more likely to bring about stigmatization. And uh, the argument of that book, and there's, there's, there's quite a bit of evidence for this now, is that more stigmatizing forms of shaming actually make crime problems worse. That if I tell you that you are a bad person who's done a bad thing, uh, you are actually more likely to become a bad person. If I tell you that what you have done is, is wrong, uh, but we continue to be in a relationship of strong respect and, and love, that's more likely to be effective. It's not also saying it's not very effective to just pretend that it didn't happen. That's counterproductive when something, you know, when it is wrong uh, to rape another human being, to not confront that and, 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 and make it clear that uh, something has to be done to take responsibility for this wrongdoing, to bear the burden of uh, some form of repair or punishment or taking the problem uh, uh, seriously in a ritually uh, serious uh, uh, fashion. Uh, it's imperative that the criminal justice system uh, does do that. That means that any criminal justice process is inherently shameful because it's saying to you that you are a person who's done something that could put you 
behind bars for a very long time. That's, that's bound, you've been picked up by the police. That's bound to be inherently shameful. But we can transact criminal justice in a way that's more reintegratively shameful, that's communicating how terribly serious what you have done is, but is doing so within a continuum of respect for you as a person and that gives you dignity and that finds a path for you to repair the harm, uh, make good, find a new place in society, to restory yourself. Shad Maruna did a wonderful study of uh, 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 Liverpool offenders who were very serious uh, offenders. And he found that those serious offenders who continued on a trajectory of a, of a life of, of crime were engulfed uh, by what, what, what he called condemnation scripts, that they were, you know, condemning themselves and they were uh, condemned by their community as people who were useless and valueless and, uh, uh, and subject to imposition of labels upon them, like junkie, uh, drug addict, uh, and, uh, and, and other such damaging ways of thinking about, uh, about the, the self. Those who moved away from a life of crime adopted redemption scripts. And what were interesting about his redemption script empirical results is that they didn't always involve uh, acknowledge, full acknowledgement of the wrong doing. And this has been a bit of a challenge for the restorative justice literature where we've said, well, we, we, we must go forward to reconciliation on a basis of truth. We must acknowledge the harm, the, the full nature of the, the wrong that we've done. But in a lot of these redemption scripts, what they would say to themselves is that uh, when I did that, that was another me who did that. When I did that, I was recovering from my, the child abuse I experienced at the hands of my father. And I have recovered from that now. I have, I have rediscovered the real me and the real me is a law-abiding me that wants to stay straight and never commit those kind of criminal offences again. Or they might have a redemption script that says, when I did that, I was still under the influence of the heroin. Now I am determined to be my real self, which is a heroin-free self, and that person, which is the real me, would never commit that, that, that kind of uh, offence. So there's, there's kind of a denial of responsibility in uh, that redemption script result. And it goes to the, to the complexity of the conversation that needs to occur among the stakeholders in a restorative justice conference to leave space for that kind of outcome. Uh, Eliza Ahmed's research is on bullying in Australia and in her home country of Bangladesh and bullying in the context of schools and in the context of workplaces in both, in both countries. And what she's found is that uh, shame management variables, as she calls them, are very important. That yes, uh, people who have experienced a lot of stigmatization in their life are more likely to engage in bullying. People who have experienced reintegrative shaming are less likely uh, to engage in, in, in bullying. In addition, she finds that those who have what she calls shame acknowledgement are less likely uh, to be uh, uh, bullies. Uh, bullies uh, are into shame displacement. When they are accused of doing something wrong, they're very big on accusing the accusers, blaming some, someone else for what has uh, happened. So they experience shame on her analysis, but they displace the shame rather than acknowledge the shame that yes, yes, this bullying behavior was wrong. Uh, there is a need to apologize. There is a need to offer to do something to repair the harm. There is a need to be willing uh, to meet uh, the victim if the victim wants to meet me and to hear what it is that they would like me to do to repair the harm. So that's shame, uh, shame acknowledgement and her data shows that where there's shame acknowledgement, you're less likely uh, to be a bully. 
But the interesting thing about victims of bullying is that uh, their uh, shame problem was one of blaming themselves. So they internalised the shame of the bullying incident. So I was bullied. There must be something wrong with me that I was picked on in that way and feeling, internalising the shame and, and feeling bad about, um, about themselves. So those who were bullies were into shame displacement. Those who were neither bullies nor victims of bullying uh, were uh, into shame acknowledgement. And, and those who were both bullies and victims, and there are a lot of those, there are a lot of people who were big time bullies who have been victims of bullying themselves in, their, in the past, so they sort of pass it on. They, the bully victims, uh, uh, carry the shame management pathologies of both the bullies and the victims. That is to say, the bully victims are big on shame displacement, they're weak on shame acknowledgement, and they also have this internalisation of, uh, of, 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 of shame, which is a problem for, for victims of bullying. These were very important results, and, and Eliza then went on to build that into an analysis about pride management, as well as shame uh, management. And the pride management effects were also very strong effects in explaining bullying. So we've seen that one of the things about shame is that there's good and bad shame. That when shaming is reintegrative, it can be a, a positive thing. When shaming is stigmatizing, it can be a, uh, a bad thing. When shame is displaced, it can be a counterproductive thing that leads to, uh, leads to bullying. Eliza found the same thing about pride, that there's good pride and there's bad pride. So what is good pride? Good pride is uh, uh, acknowledging that when one works in a team to accomplish that, we say, you know, well done, we did well, and I made my little contribution uh, to it, and that was a, uh, an important accomplishment in which we take satisfaction and pat ourselves on the back and pat each other on the, on the, on the back. That's healthy pride, but narcissistic pride is the pride that says, well, because I've accomplished this, I'm better than you. You know, I'm the best, or our team is the, uh, our team is the best. And so narcissistic pride is vaunting pride, which puts ourselves above uh, others. And, uh, uh, and so uh, she got this other interesting uh, result that uh, bullies are people uh, who not only have counterproductive shame management, they have counterproductive pride management. Bullies are people who are into narcissistic pride, whereas people who are neither bullies nor victims of bullying, who manage their way out of situations where bullying occurs, uh, are people who are into humble pride. So we learn in families how to manage shame and manage pride in socially healthy ways that allow us to go out into the community and be productive members of the community who prevent things like bullying from happening not only to ourselves and to others. So restorative justice is, is, can be conceived then as about helping people to understand through the testimony of uh, virtuous people in the restorative justice circles, uh, circle who know how to manage shame in a healthy way, who know how to manage pride in a healthy way so that more of us can become good, healthy, uh, emotional managers of both our pride and our shame. Training is a, is a good thing, an important thing with restorative justice. There's, there's no doubt that people become more effective facilitators of restorative justice processes if they've had good training in it and experience is, is, is also very valuable. At the same time, it's important to recognise that, that 
not all the weight of making restorative justice work, work well rests on the facilitator that in, in a, in, when we have a community of care assembled in a restorative justice conference, if the facilitator manages something really badly, which of course they do quite often in these difficult situations, there is always the hope that other people in the circle who are mature, responsible people will jump in and do the repair work to get the conference uh, uh, back on track. So we need not only training of uh, professional facilitators, if you like, but we need training of the, of the whole society that we all have a role to step in and, and, and make processes more reintegrative and, and constructive that, that confront uh, serious crime problems when they, when they uh, uh, occur. It's also the case that uh, in any community, like uh, actually children can be very effective restorative justice facilitators when it comes to matters like uh, schoolyard bullying and so on. And, and, and we need a culture in which uh, at all stages of the, of the life cycle, we have people who are leaders and who will make reconcil help reconciliation to occur on the spot, get two boys who are fighting each other to reconcile before the teacher is called in to mediate uh, the dispute. And we can have education systems where those skills become a more widespread. So in, in any classroom, there's, there's someone who's really uh, uh, quite good at uh, being a facilitative, empowering uh, mediator. And, but most of us are, are not, I'm not particularly good at it. I've had too many years as a university pr professor talking at people and that's not the right sort of skill set. It's a listening, engaging uh, skill set where the power of silence in a restorative justice conference is very important for the s facilitators to sit back and let that silence be there until someone will jump in accepting the right kind of active responsibility for putting something right rather than the facilitating facilitator trying to drive the, uh, the conference forward. So yes, there is, a, there is a lot to learn. There are a lot to learn about options, about the value of following through on a conference with a celebration uh, conference so that when something is accomplished, there's uh, humble pride is taken in the fact that the, the conference agreement has been executed and uh, people who have been adversely affected by the crime have been healed as a result of the, of the restorative uh, justice uh, uh, process. Uh, one of the things I notice about people who are very gifted at restorative justice, Terry O'Connell, who I mentioned uh, uh, earlier in the conference with the 14-year-old girl is one example. Uh, he, he's a person who's gifted in using humour in, in difficult situations where people are angry and upset. He can say something that's slightly amusing but not inappropriately amusing that puts people at, at ease. And that's a gift that most people don't have and probably that no one has if they're not working in the milieu of their own culture, a culture that they, uh, that they know well. So it's very hard for the, for the foreigner to come in and be a good facilitator in a post-conflict restorative justice situation. You really need locally knowledgeable people who, who actually do have the capacity to, to use humour to diffuse and get things moving in difficult roadblocks in the process. But, it, but it, what also follows that from is selecting, social selection is actually more important than training. Uh, making sure that you're selecting for the facilitator role people who have the relevant set of gifts and then sharpening, honing those gifts uh, with, the, with the right sort of training. The other corrective there is that if you've had a bad conference conducted by a bad facilitator, you try to save the day. The, you know, the bad facilitator who's made a botch of a particular conference tries to save the day by reconvening uh, the conference and when he or she reconvenes they can do it uh, with a co-facilitator uh, being in the process with them because it's been a difficult 
an unsuccessful process. So you you do two things. You you bring the co-facilitator in, but you also widen the number of participants. So the civil society is also bringing more problem-solving resources into the circle. So at the end of the day, I'm thinking of restorative justice as being about community building and democracy building. And that's why restorative justice is really important in schools, and schools is the most important place for the social movement for restorative justice to be investing in development at this stage in the history of the development of, of restorative justice. That children are not born democratic. We, we, we have to learn to be democratic. We, we have to learn to be democratic citizens through participation in democratic uh, decision making. And a restorative justice conference over an inc inc incident of bullying in a school is a good example of where children can learn to be more democratic. So I think this aspect of the re vision for restorative justice is that where all, all, all children in their school experience, but also in their family experience, and then later in their early workplace experiences, are learning how to be facilitative in listening to other human beings who they've done harm to or who have done harm uh, to them and being problem-solving democratic citizens. Well, I think of regulation as a, as a general term, meaning steer, steering the flow of events so that a criminal justice process is a regulatory process. A restorative justice conference in a school is a regulatory process. It just so happens that we use the word regulation when we're thinking of uh, business regulation, companies and securities regulation, environmental consumer protection uh, regulation. And indeed, the, uh, much of the developmental work on responsive regulation as an idea has come from that domain of business regulation. Responsive regulation in that uh, context uh, means where the, uh, where, where the business regulator is designing the regulation in a way that's responsive to the regulatory environment and doing it in a way where they're not doing all the designing but they're inviting the subjects of the regulation to do a lot of the designing work themselves. This is the idea of outside in design rather than inside out uh, design. Uh, with inside out design, a government uh, a regulator says, here are your new set of rules, here is what you have to comply with, and they're given to those who have to be regulated. With outside in design, there's a sitting down in the circle of the regulatory stakeholders. Well, so how are we going to, how, we, how are we going to set up this regulatory system? How would you design it so it will work well with justice, with fairness, with respect for your rights, but get the job done of, say, protecting uh, the environment? So that's the idea of outside in design as a more responsive way of doing regulation, responsive to what the regulated community would like to uh, see happening. So it's responsiveness in the sense of listening. It's responsiveness in the sense of being responsive to what's happening in the, in the business environment. But thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, it's being responsive to the way regulated actors respond. So if you are a business who I am regulating and uh, uh, you respond to my raising a concern about a matter by writing a letter to you and saying, I, I think you know, your effluent from this pipe is a bit of a problem, and you respond to me by saying, oh, I hadn't noticed that those effluent levels had got up, and indeed there's been some failures in our system, and we're putting in place remedial measures, and we're going to compensate these uh, 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 fishermen who've been adversely affected by the pollution and, and so on. So because you are responding well, my response as a regulator is going to be uh, 
is, is going to be different. So those, those are the core ideas of responsive regulation. The responsive regulatory pyramid is a, is a key idea here, and that is that what we want to do is start at the base of a regulatory pyramid with cooperative, educative, collaborative ways of solving problems. And when they fail and fail again, we might escalate uh, to a way of regulating you that is more about deterrence. And if deterrent fails, we may escalate higher up to uh, incapacitation. So putting you in prison is a way of incapacitating you so you can't uh, commit uh, an offence again. But with business regulation, there, there are many ways to uh, incapacitate uh, business uh, actors. Uh, so if you run a medical practice and are doing damage to people, I might incapacitate you by taking away your licence to practice uh, medicine. If you're a company with a set of directors, I may insist that you put in place uh, new directors who have uh, uh, a better skill set for ensuring that your organisation continues to be in compliance with the law. So there are many ways of doing incapacitation, but that's the broad uh, picture of how responsive regulation works. You start at the base of the pyramid. The base of the pyramid is where you want to be with collaborative, cooperative forms of uh, regulation that are low on intervention. When that fails and fails again, you escalate to deterrence. When deterrence fails, you escalate to tougher deterrence. When it fails again, to tougher deterrence still. And then at the peak of the pyramid, you might take away the license of a business to operate. So it can no longer um, uh, be a pharmaceutical company and sell pharmaceutical products to pharmacies, uh, for example. So that, that's, that's, in effect, corporate capital punishment at the peak of the pyramid. And the idea of the regulatory pyramid is through having a tough peak to the pyramid, which would include things like the capacity to put people in prison or to take away their license to operate their business, you drive more of the action down to the cooperative base of the pyramid. You want a regulatory system where voluntary self-regulation, problem solving through active responsibility uh, does most of the work of the regulation and indeed a system where you're harnessing the managerial creativity of the industry to come up with the solutions, the outside in design point, rather than the government saying, or oh, here's how you must manage your, your effluence. You want a regulatory system where you, say, you, you know, you, you're the expert on this kind of production system. You come up with a production system that will minimise the amount of pollution that's going on. So where does restorative justice fit in here? Well, it fits in at the base of the pyramid. So our preference will be for solving problems through restorative justice at the base of the pyramid. So if I'm a business regulator and I have a problem with your business, I'm going to want to call you in and we're going to want to sit around the table and see if we can come up with a, with a solution for coming into compliance with the law and for repairing the the harm that's that's been done. And only if you're not making restorative justice work or you're failing to honour your undertakings to implement the agreement that's sorted out in the restorative justice conference are we likely to escalate up to the peak of the, the pyramid. Now that's not always going to be the case. There, there, there will be circumstances where we want to go straight to the peak of the pyramid. But the idea of the pyramid is that we have a presumption in favour of starting at the base of the pyramid. We want to solve problems through dialogue as much as we, as, as we can. And we want to solve them through uh, taking people uh, to the courts and, and punish them uh, parsimoniously, not doing that uh, uh, a, a, in a high proportion of, uh, of, 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 of cases. People say about restorative justice that uh, there's been a restorative justice conference and it didn't work. And you know what they did then? They convened another conference. Uh, 
And for a restorative justice person, that always seems an odd reaction because we hold criminal trials all the time and they don't work. The offender reoffends again. And there are, there are people out there in the community and companies out there in the community that have been prosecuted 60 or 70 times. And we don't say, well, we should stop prosecuting them because obviously it's not working. Uh, what we've got to do is adjust the way we prosecute and in the case of restorative justice, we've got to adjust the way uh, we do uh, restorative justice. So in one, in, one, in one of the simplest ways is by uh, widening the circle. In the training of restorative justice facilitators, a key skill to learn is how to get the right people along to the event. Because if you get the right people into the event, as we've seen, they can make up for the mistakes that you make as a facilitator because they bring some resources that maybe you don't have uh, into the circle. And they certainly, in the, in the in a, in a case of a, a business offence, may have a technological knowledge of what's needed to get into compliance that you actually don't have as the civil servant in a government, uh, uh, in, a, in a government agency. So one of the early, I, I spent uh, 10 years as a part-time Commissioner with uh, the ACCC, uh, the Australian uh, Competition and Consumer Commission, and uh, we, we had a case which was a, uh, a false advertising case by a, a large uh, a Victorian uh, carpeting uh, retailer. It wasn't the most serious case on our books at the time, so it was decided we should try to use, we weren't using the term restorative justice at that time but try a conferencing approach uh, to the offence. Well, the, the first conference was a bit of a disaster, well, in fact, a total uh, disaster, because the managers who were responsible for this uh, breach of the law uh, 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 said to us, in effect, uh, go jump. Uh, we think we've probably put up a good fight to defend ourselves against this in the courts. And implicitly, they were saying, even if you won the case, you're going to get a very low fine and uh, you, we're, we're through toughing it out with you, you're going to walk away and, and this is just going to uh, disappear as a problem for us. Well, instead of, and then we had a conversation at the Commission, well, does this mean we escalate to a, a, a prosecution? We decided no, we'd have another conference. So we invited that manager's boss into the circle. He was an even tougher nut and also had his lawyer there and told us to go jump in effect. And then we had another conference with the CEO in the circle and the CEO with the toughest nut of all. And finally, we had a conference with the chairman of the board in the circle, and he was actually ashamed of the fact that his CEO had responded by telling us to go jump. I mean, the, the chairman of the board's view, and this was a, he was the patriarch of this family company that he had established himself and had now uh, retired and was an elderly uh, gentleman. And, and he expected that he would have a chief executive of his company, if government officials come along and say, we think you've broken the law and you have ripped off consumers in this matter, that that would be something that the CEO would be concerned about and wanting to respond to and wanting to build a good reputation uh, with, with uh, government regulators. So he fired the... Uh, uh, chief executive, which was not a very restorative thing to do, uh, but it was a uh, uh, w what followed was a very uh, restorative uh, process of uh, consumers being voluntarily compensated, the company getting some credit for that, company sort of putting itself out there as industry leaders in compliance methods, uh, developing compliance methods that would uh, increase. Uh, future compliance with the law, and also monitoring its competitors to ensure that they were complying in future with the, uh, uh, with, with, with the same laws. And there were, there were a sequence of those cases uh, at the uh, Australian Competition Consumer Commission that were cons uh, consumer effect, uh, protection cases involving uh, insurance companies engaging in rip-offs on remote Aboriginal communities where chief executives from down in Sydney were sitting down with, with uh, people who were victims of their financial frauds in those remote communities 
coming up with agreements, having press conference where they announce, the company announces that it's done the wrong thing, it's going to compensate these, uh, these uh, uh, communities and these individuals and make their insurance policies work for them and also invest in programs for Aboriginal uh, consumer education. So these were transformative changes in the insurance industry at that time, which is now uh, 20 years ago, that left Australia with a much more responsible insurance industry in its wake. So what we learned from these early uh, conferencing experiments uh, was, uh, with, with a variety of business regulators, was that when the conference works badly, one of the options available to you is to widen the circle until you finally get into the circle, uh, someone who will take active responsibility uh, for putting the wrongdoing right. So the fact that you don't have the person with that sense of active responsibility in the circle at the first try doesn't mean that you, there's not a strategy still available uh, uh, to you. And, and it's a strategy that's not available in the same way uh, in the criminal trial as it is available in a restorative justice process, which over time can keep expanding the circle of participants, participation in the problem solving until you get the, the result. Same thing in, in peace building circles, you can keep expanding the circle until you're getting someone into the circle who can make the relationship between two villages safe into the future in, in a way that it hasn't been in the past during the war. So the theory of the, of the pyramid uh, is that at the at the base of the at the base of the pyramid, uh, you you're appealing to people's better nature. You're appear, appealing to them to be responsive and responsible. In the middle of the pyramid, you're using deterrent threats, so you're treating them as a rational actor. But then at the peak of the pyramid, you're also uh, building in the fact that often people are not rational. Actors, so you need something else. You need an incapacitating uh, uh, solution because people often fail to comply with the law, not because they don't care about the law at the base of the pyramid. They may care about it, and uh, not 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 because they're trying to cut corners as rational actors in the middle of the pyramid, but they may fail to comply the, with the law because they're just incompetent or irrational. So. If you have someone who's running a nursing home, for example, and you've got this problem of old people lying around all day in urine-soaked sheets, it might be that the problem there is not one of management wanting to cut corners on the costs of running the laundry, but just not having someone in charge who has competence in running uh, an effective system for managing the laundry. Uh, in the uh, in the facility, so you need to get new managers in charge uh, in the in the in the facility, um, and sometimes you get uh, failure for deterrence to work because uh, the the level of deterrence required is just so high with an offence where the returns to the offender are extremely high, but where the uh, where, where, where the probability of detection is very low. So if rationally there's only a one in 100 chance that you would be caught for a particular business offence and the return on that, committing that offence, is an extra million dollars of profit, you need a penalty of more than $100 million before it's rational for you to comply. So in that context, rational economic deterrence sometimes won't work either. So you, again, may want to move back down uh, to a more restorative justice approach that looks for that chairman of the board who has an ethical self that can be appealed to or at, to the peak of the pyramid where you're shutting the business down in effect because none of these things are, uh, are working. But the idea of the pyramid is it, it's a presumption that you would want to start at the base of the of, of of the pyramid. And of course there will be circumstances where you want to move straight to the peak of the pyramid. That is to say, you ask yourself the question 
as to whether you can solve this problem through education, persuasion, dialogue, or through a, a warning letter, for example. Um, but the answer will come up, say, no, that won't work, we must go. This is a very serious matter and we need a decisive movement now to the peak of the pyramid. One of the examples I use there is, uh, is if you have uh, someone who uh, has a suicide vest on and is about to detonate uh, as a suicide bomber and you have a police sniper who has a clear shot at the suicide bomber who's capable of uh, killing that person before they kill a lot of other people, then you may want to go straight to the uh, peak of the pyramid and, uh, and kill that potential terrorist. Of course, the trouble is we need to be very cautious about that because remember the story of the alleged uh, Brazilian uh, uh, terrorist who they thought, the, the London police thought, uh, was about to detonate a bomb in the underground and they pushed him to the ground and shot him and in fact uh, he was not a suicide bomber. So we always need to be open to the analysis that says, well, perhaps there is another way. Perhaps if we brought this suicide bomber's mother into the room, she may be able to reason with him and persuade him to voluntarily decide not to uh, go ahead with the, with the detonation of the bomb. So the, the, what the regulatory pyramid tells us to do is have a presumption of being as low down in the pyramid as we can and keep asking us those hard questions. Is it really right that the only way we have of solving this problem is escalating to a higher level of the pyramid? It's not the idea of the pyramid that uh, we can classify people. You know, this is a person who is absolutely incompetent, incorrigible, irrational in their commitment to breaking the law. So we must deal with them with an incapacitative solution at the peak of the pyramid. This is a person who's a rational actor. So if we just get the penalties right, they'll comply with the law. This is a person who's a, a we can work at the base of the pyramid because, or a company who we can work with at the base of the pyramid because they have corporate social responsibility, because they care about achieving compliance with environmental law. Rather, the theory of the pyramid is that uh, we all have our moments. If I think of myself, I have my moments when I am a socially responsible actor. I have my moments when I'm a rational, calculating actor asking the question, what's in this for me? And I have my, unfortunately, far too many moments where I'm an incompetent or irrational actor. So the idea is that we all have multiple selves and responsive regulation is a strategy for driving more of the action down to the base of the pyramid where our socially responsible self, our self who takes active responsibility in a restorative justice conference will, will have uh, more space to be, uh, to be in play. So it's even if we are most of the time a very bad person, the idea of responsive regulation is to treat us as a good person in the hope that we might just step forward with our socially responsible self rather than our corner cutting or ruthless uh, business self or ruthless criminal self. So it's not as if we go to the peak of the pyramid when a problem is very serious automatically. Sometimes we'll deal with very serious matters through restorative justice at the base of the pyramid because that can work well and do, deliver the result at low cost uh, to the community and with a high degree of commitment to making implementation work in our outside-in design strategy. The, the mistake of thinking that because something is a, a big risk and therefore must be dealt with by a highly punitive, highly interventionist and directive form of state regulation. We, we learnt that from the regulation of the nuclear power industry. Uh, in the United States, before the Three Mile Island, near 
nuclear meltdown in 1979, um, there was the view that the risk of a uh, of a nuclear reactor meltdown was a, was you know, quite a high and significant risk, and because it would be such a catastrophic uh, impact on urban populations in the areas surrounding nuclear power plants, it had to be quite a tough, punitive, directive approach to regulation with very tight setting of many detailed rules and inspectors, government inspectors coming in and checking that those rules are being complied with and enforcing compliance with them. What the inquiry into the Three Mile Island disaster concluded was that that had been a strategic mistake. So when the Three Mile Island accident occurred, what you had was a whole lot of nuclear reactor managers running around saying, oh, which rule haven't we complied with? We'll be in trouble if we haven't you know, got our compliance right with all these rules. So they're, they're checking whether they've dotted the I's and crossed the T's on this long list of, of little rules. And, and in fact, as managers, the commission concluded is that they had lost systemic wisdom about how the safety system in that nuclear power plant worked. So what you need is a regulatory design which is outside in, in such a way that people who are in the industry are actually understanding the dynamics of the risks and how to manage them in a crisis. And you don't always get that in a highly rule intensive uh, enforcement oriented regime. So they moved to uh, what Joseph Rees has called a more communitarian regulatory uh, regime where you were harnessing the managerial creativity of the industry to come up with self-regulatory solutions to their own problems, their particularistic problems in the context of the engineering environment of that particular power plant. The airline industry is another industry where that kind of lesson has been learned. It's, a, it's an industry that's had a remarkable accomplishment of a similar kind to that of the nuclear industry. Uh, a bit harder to measure in the nuclear industry, but there they measure scrams, which are automated shutdowns of nuclear power plants. In the decade after Three Mile Island, there was a tenfold reduction in the, in the number of scrams. Uh, uh, per annum, per plant, uh, and another tenfold reduction so that in the next decade, so that within two decades, it was the incidence of that risk, high risk kind of event was one hundredth of what it was. Similarly, uh, air accidents are, uh, have had a reduction in adverse safety incidents of that kind. In the early years of uh, air travel in the uh, uh, early and even mid decades of the 20th century, there were a lot of planes going down, uh, uh, actually. And how, so how was it accomplished? So that we have this remarkable result where today, uh, to travel uh, through the, to get from A to B by flying through the air is actually safer than it is by driving along uh, on, the, uh, on the ground or going across the ocean in a ship to, uh, uh, to get from A to B. It was really accomplished by a regulatory regime which from the beginning did not make that mistake that the, that the nuclear industry made, that uh, actually rewarded people for stepping forward, rewarded pilots, for example, for stepping forward if they had a near miss and say, I nearly ran into that other plane uh, today. Here's what happened. Here's how it's happened. Uh, here's my analysis of what we have to learn on what we need to do to avoid this happening again. So the key was, was learning from, uh, from near misses and actually rewarding pilots with enhanced professional reputation when they would step forward with testimony about a near miss for which they were responsible rather than punishing them for that uh, failure to keep their plane in the safest uh, possible circumstances. And as, on the back of that, there could be continuous improvement over time. It's not to say that it's not a regulatory regime that's devoid of punishment at the peak of the pyramid. 
where punishment is most likely to occur under such a, a regime is where you cover up. So if you have your near miss and you cover it up uh, so that you don't have to deal with it and, 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 and respond to it uh, in, in a responsive way, uh, then you may well uh, lose your license as a pilot. In addition to having a pyramid where you escalate from uh, non-punitive collaborative problem solving approaches such as a conversation in a, in a, in a, in a circle, uh, moving up uh, to a, sort of a, a letter asking for compliance, moving up to some low level penalty and then ultimately moving up to some incapacitative approach such as putting uh, someone uh, in, in prison. That's, a, that's an enforcement pyramid. In addition, you can have a pyramid of regulatory strategies where you have a, a pre preference for solving problems at the base of the pyramid through capacity building, then self-regulation, and then you can have something called enforced self-regulation where you just don't trust the industry to come up with its own self-regulatory regime. You may require the industry, yes, you must design a self-regulatory system, but you must also provide us with evidence that whenever breaches of your own self-regulatory rules occur, you report them to the government and you take your own enforcement action. You provide the evidence to uh, the, the government regulator so that they can enforce the law that you have written yourself. So an, an enforced self-regulation means uh, public ratification of privately written rules and then public enforcement of those privately written rules, whereas pure self-regulation is private self-regulation of privately written, written rules. So that you, you can have escalation up to a more command and control form of regulation with, with these stages in between of voluntarism, self-regulation, enforced self-regulation before you get up to a command and control regulatory system. So that's a hierarchy, a pyramid of regulatory strategies, as opposed to just a pyramid of sanctions, if you like. In addition to having a pyramid of sanctions, we also, in responsive reg regulation, need a pyramid of supports. So support is more important than sanction in getting compliance with the, with the law. Education as to what the obligations of the law are are a very fundamental and basic form of, of social support for compliance with the law. But you also want support where, say you have an environmental regulation challenge where some company that innovates with a wonderful new form of environmental control technology where you, where you give them some sort of uh, prize, uh, 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 perhaps, uh, uh, and, and, uh, or grants so they can further develop. So the government is giving them rewards on the back of their improvement rather than giving them sanctions on the back of their deterioration. So the idea of a pyramid of supports is that you, you, would, you would first like to start at the base of the pyramid again and get improvement through capacity building and uh, some consultation at times as to what other companies are doing to come in compliance with this particular kind of uh, law. In the nuclear uh, industry, one of the things they did in the aftermath of Three Mile Island was twinning. So companies that had wonderful safety records, twinning with companies that did not have such good safety records so that there would be peer review and a process of improvement. So these are all examples of support. And then moving up the pyramid of, of, of supports up to sort of Academy Awards for being the, uh, the leader of the industry, uh, if, if you like, and uh, positive publicity. And that's often important in the aftermath of a serious breach of the law. Because very often in the business regulation game, if you look around and ask yourself the question, which is the company on the horizon that has the best compliance system going, in the industry, it'll be a company that's recently been in trouble with the regulator and as a result of that trouble has invested 
in rethinking compliance systems and coming up with with better managerial creativity to design out uh, environmental damage, uh, for example, so that what we're hoping for is a world there that a company that's been moved up the pyramid of sanctions will then move down it and move up the pyramid of supports and get positive publicity from the media, the government, for being a new leader. Uh, so you, you, you're trying to uh, achieve improved compliance with the law, not only by pushing the laggards up above a minimum standard, but also by getting the leaders of an industry to pull the whole game upwards and through taking the game up through new ceilings, they will drag up the laggards above the floor uh, as, uh, as well. So this is why the pyramid of supports is very important as a complement to the pyramid of sanctions and the pyramid of regulatory strategies. Responsive regulation is relevant to common crime as well as business regulation. Let, let me illustrate with the gang crime phenomenon. There was a very important project in Boston called Operation Ceasefire. They had a very high gun homicide rate uh, in Boston in the 1980s and, and 90s. And uh, what they did, they had an enforcement swamping problem as any city with a, with a large number of gangs and a lot of gun homicide occurring, very difficult for the police to keep up in, in that kind of very high crime environment. So what they did is they sort of had a summit of uh, uh, gang members and said to them, in effect, we know uh, that you know uh, that we don't have the capacity to crack down on all the criminal offence offending that all of you gangs are doing out there, especially in drug markets and so on. Uh, but we want to tell you this, we've got a change of policy in play here and we want you to understand that we do have the capacity to crack down on the first gang that fires a gun in the course of any of its criminal activities. That our priority is to shut down gun violence in, in Boston. And they had success, substantial success in accomplishing that uh, because you know what those gangs did was they went away and had their conversations with each other and so, well, you know, how can we change our business model, our cocaine business model or whatever uh, illicit business they were in, you know, defend our prostitution market? Uh, how can we do these, uh, continue to do these activities without shooting at anyone? Uh, so they sort of engineered out the shooting of guns and as a result, uh, the gun homicide rate uh, uh, came down very sharply. In, uh, in, in, in Boston. So these sort of targeted defer deterrence activities where you're actually making some choices, uh, not trying to achieve everything at once, but also projecting to them an enforcement pyramid in effect that if you stay down here and do your you know, prostitution uh, business uh, without ever firing a gun, uh, there's not going to be escalation. But if violence is occurring in the context of your gang activity, and if it continues to occur, you will find a lot of you will end up in jail. And when they did that, when they went after a gang, they would not just go after them for the gun offence. You know, if you, if you have a, a, a gang in the context of a, 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 of a large American city, there are all sorts of things that if you prioritise uh, targeting them, you can go after them. There are large numbers of members of the gang who are in, in breach of their parole conditions, for example. So you go around and you round them up and say, oh, you haven't reported, uh, you're late in your reporting, and so you're back into prison. So that's the way, basically, they did that uh, targeting and made Boston a much safer place in which to live. So I'm wanting to interpret that through a responsive regulatory lens that escalation has two qualities, escalations to the peak of the pyramid. Firstly, it, it's selective. Secondly, 
And this is a really important point. Deterrence is dynamic. One of the problems we have in criminology is we tend to think of deterrence as a passive thing. So if we get the penalties right, and we put those penalties out there and say to the community, if you do that, you will be executed. If you do this, you will get life imprisonment. If you do something else, you will get five years in prison. So the deterrent threat sits there as a passive threat. Doesn't work very well, unfortunately. Um, escalating the penalties, increasing from life imprisonment as the maximum penalty to execution. It's surprising. You'd think people would be worried about being executed, but passive deterrence in the criminological literature does not work uh, very well. What works better and, and where criminology can learn from business regulation experience is that it's dynamic enforcement, uh, dynamic concentration of deterrence as in Operation Ceasefire in, in, in Boston uh, illustrates. And that's always been out there uh, in, the, uh, in our understanding and our experience. Uh, in our youth, uh, some of us will have seen the, uh, uh, the, the movie, the Texas Ranger movie that uh, Mark Kleiman talks about where uh, the bad guy has been uh, arrested and uh, saved from the lynch mob by the Texas Ranger and the lynch mob arrives at the, at, at the, at the Ranger's uh, cell block and says, let him go, you've got to let him out. And the Texas Ranger has only one bullet left in his gun. But he says to the crowd, the first person to step forward gets it. <laughs> so they all think, oh, you know, and none of them wants to be the first person to step forward. So you would think you would have a, an enforcement swamping crisis where with one bullet in his gun and, it, and confronting a huge crowd, he would have no capability to manage that crowd. But the, the insight, of the theory of concentrated deterrence is that uh, you only need to threaten the person who first steps forward and then it will work with the second person and the third person. So it's the same insight as the enforcement swamping lesson from, the, uh, uh, from Operation Ceasefire in, in Boston. That is to say the Boston police did not have the resources to crack down on all of those gangs but it did have the resources to concentrate on the first gang that stepped forward and engaged in, uh, in the use of firearms in its, uh, its activity. So that this is the idea of dynamic concentration of deterrence and the regulatory pyramid is, uh, uh, is an example of, uh, of how you can uh, concentrate deterrence dynamically rather than just have passive deterrence. An interesting and challenging example of an individual crime where Kathy Daly and I have argued that a responsive regulatory pyramid is, is relevant is domestic violence. Now many victims of domestic violence will not take their case to the police because the perpetrator is a, is a member of their family. In Australian culture, for example, not many people understand the fact that we have quite a big problem of sons assaulting their mothers. And mothers don't come forward to report this kind of offence to the, the police because it's their own son who's, uh, who's, who's done it to them. So what we need is a way of regulating domestic violence of that kind and indeed of every kind that will give victims an option of doing something about the violence. So that we're able to say to victims, look, please come forward because we can, we can try dealing with this in a, in a restorative justice conference first when undertakings will be given that will make you safe in future and that will hopefully lead to the offender who is living within your family taking some steps to control uh, uh, his or her anger so that anger management programs becomes one of the things that can happen as a result of a restorative justice process 
for domestic violence, but more interventionist things higher up the pyramid can come into play uh, as well. Obviously, at the peak of the pyramid, if he continues to engage in domestic violence, we put him in jail. And that's part of the story that we're projecting in the restorative justice uh, process, that responsive regulation is about the, the idea that you ought to come up with a negotiated solution uh, which will give people safety because if you don't, you will be on a slippery slope that will lead to a sticky end. That there's an image of invincibility about the capacity for state intervention. The state is going to stick with your domestic violence problem until it stops. It's really up to you to take active responsibility for doing what it takes to give your family members safety, to, 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 to fix the problem that you have uh, that is causing this domestic violence to occur. Uh, but if you don't, understand that we are going to stick with the problem and you will end up in jail. But then in between, at lower levels of the pyramid, there might be all sorts of other things that will occur along the journey. There might be one restorative justice conference that fails and then another incident of violence occurs and then there's another conference where some other measures are, are agreed. Now those measures might include things uh, like uh, the uh, perpetrator spending a month away living somewhere else and seeing if in the course of that month he starts the anger management program and some progress starts to occur and if some progress is visible, then he can return home. Another alternative might be that another family member goes to live in the house. You know, an older son comes back to return home to regulate the behaviour of the younger son who is assaulting his mother. Uh, it might be uh, that uh, if it is a wife being assaulted on a regular basis by a husband, we need to change the financial arrangements for the family so that the husband no longer controls the bank book, as it were, so that if the, if, if the wife has access to the family's income, she can leave because she's financially able to leave. If the diagnosis of the conference is that the problem uh, is that she has no choice but to stay with this violent man because she won't be able to have any money to live and eat uh, if she if, if she wa walks out. And then there are sort of hotline possibilities that can also be put into that kind of regulatory pyramid that a certain relative will check on a regular basis at, uh, at certain times and insist in certain environments. Let's say it's an agreement that if ever he goes out drinking, he's not allowed to go home. He's got to then spend the night at his cousin's place and his cousin will keep an eye on him and send him back home. Uh, when, he's, uh, when he's sobered up. Now, all of these diagnostic possibilities are there in, des in designing a responsive regulatory pyramid for domestic violence that enables us to say to victims, look, don't think that the only option is putting your loved one in jail. That is an option. And we want it to be clear to him that it should be an option and that you should not be afraid of looking at that option in the eye and say, you will. You will give the testimony that will put your, love, your own loved one in jail. But our hope is that through signalling that at the peak of the pyramid, we will come up with solutions that will make you safe and that will make him change at lower levels of the pyramid. So that's the responsive regulation idea as applied to the, uh, to the problem of domestic violence. All of the things that we've been talking about are very dangerous things to do. Shaming is a dangerous game. Shaming can be deeply destructive of, of, of people, as we've discussed. Putting someone in prison can be also be deeply destructive of a human being. In our country here in Australia, we have so much evidence now of Aboriginal people who've been 
put in prison and as a result of being taken away from from their country and from their loved ones uh, uh, commit suicide uh, in in prison so in a sense in a, in the process of solving one problem we create an even bigger problem so because we are playing with dangerous games of punitiveness and 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 and, and shaming we've got to have a sort of a philosophy of how to do these things with great moderation, circumspection, in an evidence-based way that draws our attention to when counterproductive outcomes occur and to what then it might be that we need to do to prevent that counterproductive outcome from happening again. So having an evidence-based philosophy is, is at the heart of a responsible approach. But because the damage that a criminal justice system can do is of a similar kind to the damage that crime itself does. So the damage of putting that child from Rwanda who has hacked someone to death into a prison where they themselves are a victim of sexual assault which results in them contracting HIV AIDS and also dying themselves. These are forms of domination of human beings that have a lot in common. And the shared thing is one human being dominating another. So Philip Pettit and I, in our, in our book, Not Just Desserts, A Republican Theory of Criminal Justice, we argue that because this domination feature, this, this crushing of the freedom of human beings is what crime does. The crime of rape it is about dominating the freedom of, of women uh, in, in particular. Putting the rapist in prison is about taking away freedom from the convicted rapist. So what we want to do ethically, we argue in that book, is minimise the amount of domination in the world. So if putting a person in prison causes more harm in terms of increasing the amount of domination in the world than the amount of domination that's prevented uh, by putting them into prison, then that's a bad criminal justice policy. So that was the argument about putting those children in Rwanda who had hacked other human beings to death, putting them in prison for eight years awaiting trial, that caused more domination than it prevented and therefore was an evil uh, criminal justice policy which made the, the world a worse place. So that for us that's the ethical test. It's not like you need a sentencing system that says these are proportional punishments. If you do this, you must get that. Uh, uh, because what we want to do is minimise the amount of domination in the world. And if we have an automatic, inflexible response, sometimes we will punish an Aboriginal offender for, who is quite guilty of the offence of which they have been convicted, but who as a result of that conviction will hang themselves in prison and we will have made the world a worse place. We will have also done something bad for race relations uh, in our country. And all of these issues of domination must be there in the balance as we make these very difficult decisions of where wisdom uh, should lead us to decide that a, that a moderate and effective uh, justice uh, system will have us go. So in a restorative justice philosophy, it's not about equal justice for equal wrongs. It's not a philosophy of proportionate punishment. It's actually a philosophy that says, yes, punishment is an important part of a criminal justice system because you need deterrence and you need incapacitation in your, uh, in your regulatory pyramid. 
But the normal response, the mainline response, should not be a punitive response. It should be a, a rehabilitative, reconciliatory, reintegrative response that takes deadly seriously the shamefulness of crime, but does not then take from that that what you need to have is proportional punishment. And one reason for thinking that way from this civic republican philosophical point of view that Philip Pettit and I developed uh, it, it, in that book is that if you have equal punishment for equal wrongs, what about the victim who wants something different from that equal punishment for equal wrongs. So a, a very famous case in New Zealand was the Clotworthy case, where a criminal offender attacked uh, a man at a bus stop and uh, punctured his uh, lung. The man had been an epileptic before and had recovered from the epilepsy. His epilepsy returned as a result of the uh, traumatic uh, uh, assault. Uh, he also had a terrible uh, cut across his face. So it was a knife attack that went uh, uh, very close to being a murder. When it went to the court, the victim, uh, who had been in prison himself, and said, I don't want to see him go to prison because I have learned through my own experience about how destructive prison can be for a human being. And besides, I have a practical need as a, as a victim. This getting plastic surgery for this terrible slash wound on my face is not something that's covered by the, you know, the New Zealand compensation scheme at that time, apparently did not uh, cover plastic surgery. So I need $120,000. Uh, to pay for a plastic surgeon to put to repair this particular aspect of the harm. You have a job. He did have a job, the perpetrator. So if you give me your savings that you have at the moment to put toward the doctor's bill and then pay it off at the rate of uh, uh, X thousand a year, well, I can I can get my plastic surgery done. Uh, and besides, I also want, and more than that, I want a restorative justice conference where we talk about these issues, because this victim had heard the message about restorative justice and actually believed in it. So they had a restorative justice conference. They came back to the judge with this proposal. Uh, the judge accepted the recommendation of the conference, uh, imposed a, a suspended sentence of several years. So if he didn't comply with the agreement, he would go into prison. But if he kept up the payments, if he wrote the letter of apology, if he did some community service work and some other things as well, that would keep him out of jail. Well, the prosecutor, of course, found that a bad outcome for a crime that was nearly a murder, appealed to the Court of Appeal. The Court of Appeal uh, went with the prosecutor and said, look, we do accept that restorative justice is now a principle of New Zealand sentencing. And in that, so in that sense, the Clotworthy case was a productive case in helping to bed down restorative justice as a principle of sentencing in, in New Zealand law. However, we think this is a step too far. This is a very serious crime. We need to give a deterrent message for crime of this seriousness. So you have to go to prison. And because you're going to prison for quite a considerable number of years, of course, you will not have a job that will allow you to pay for the plastic surgery. We don't know why, but in the period uh, not so long after this, the victim committed suicide. Uh, the man who had the slash wound to his face committed suicide. So I, I often put this dilemma to my students and I say, well, who decided the case rightly? Did the New Zealand Court of Appeal decide it rightly, uh, or did the district court judge who accepted the restorative justice agreement and gave the victim uh, the grace of forgiveness? The victim 
want, one of the things that the victim wanted out of this process was the grace of being able to forgive and keep out of prison someone who'd done a terrible injustice to them. And of course, that was uh, my argument, that it was taking that away from the victim, which is something that we might conceive the victim of, even in an extreme formulation, as having a right uh, to that uh, to that forgiveness, and and certainly a right uh, to the plastic surgery uh, to repair uh, the the harm. So that the way Philip and Pettit, Philip Pettit and I argue about things is that the the way to think philosophically about justice is not equal justice for equal wrongs, not proportionate punishment, but equal concern for the justice claims of every stakeholder. So that means equal concerns for the victim in the Clotworthy case, if what that victim wants is that, uh, is that plastic surgery, that is a claim that deserves equal consideration alongside the consideration of equal punishment for equal wrongs for the, for the perpetrator. Uh, so a more difficult philosophical judgment to make is if, if we have equal concern for all stakeholders, justice claims, how do we strike the balance? Well, in a democracy, this takes us back to restorative justice as a democratic philosophy. We want to hear all the voices about which justice claims have more merit and how should we strike the balance between those justice claims. But it means a very different way of thinking about justice from our present criminal justice system, where, for example, the family of an Aboriginal offender uh, who's, uh, uh, whose breadwinner goes into prison and who is contemplating suicide and where that family outside is worrying about him committing suicide, they are stakeholders in the injustice that have occurred here. So there's a big, there's quite a radical philosophical shift there in saying that that Aboriginal family, if they are going to suffer as a result of this uh, injustice that's occurred, their justice claims deserve equal consideration along with the justice claims of the victim and the offender. So, so many of the things that I've been discussing outside in design is about empowering civil society in the democracy. So it's not narrowly focused on just how, to, how the justice system can be more effective in objectives like preventing crime, respecting rights. It's also about a vision for a richer democracy. It's also about a response to our current ailment in this society and in most Western societies where ordinary people feel out of touch with their democratic institutions, where ordinary people don't trust their institutions, they don't trust their politicians, partly because they're so marginalised and have no opportunity to have a say in something that matters to them a lot. So restorative justice in our schools, in our workplaces, in our families, churches, Defence Department, it's about outside in design where the insiders are not telling us how to regulate our lives all the time, but we're coming up with our own solutions as to how we want to regulate domestic violence in our family, how we want to regulate bullying on our submarine in our, in, in our church, about how we want to go about the, uh, the business of getting gangs to surrender in our community who are threatening the safety of our, our community and coming up with a negotiated settlement with the citizens of the, of the community where the citizens will, will feel that it's not the police that are doing 
all of the work here, we've actually participated in a process that has made our community safer in a way that, that, that matters to us. So it's this getting back to this ambition at the beginning of the judicial branch becoming the branch of democracy that reinvigorates democratic participation more than the legislature or more than executive governments, that we care about our court case and through caring about our court case, through caring about that next door neighbour who does me the honour of inviting me to participate in his restorative justice conference, we can have that individual-centred communitarianism, but one that moves from a, a micro problem solving up to the macro construction of a more genuinely democratic society.